Mrs. Senator, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Campiani? Here. Mr. Matheson? Here. Mr. Paulson? Here. Mrs. Swanson? Here. Mr. Roman? Here. Mrs. Coghill has not arrived yet. Mrs. Intihar? Here. Mrs. Loyakana, would you lead us in the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, there are there any modifications to the agenda the board members wish to make? And I actually have one. I'd like to just um, please reorder the action items to put the uh, approval of the goals uh, up at the top. So approval of board goals followed by approval of superintendent goals. Thank you. Any, anything else? Okay, uh, recognitions and achievements. Dr. Harris. Thank you, Mrs. Zendahar. And this evening, we are excited to have uh, some very special athletes here this evening that have done well in their recent competitions. And I'm going to introduce Mr. Adam Ferguson, who is our director, one of our directors, special education, and also the coach for the Special Olympians. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Ferguson. Thank you guys very much for having us tonight, and thank you for all the athletes for making it out. Um, every year, I've done this for 14 years, um, Special Olympics, and every year I wonder how the, the, the year's going to top the previous. And every year, the athletes just blow me away with all their achievements. Um, we start our season every fall with um, now bocce. This is going to be our second year to have a bocce team. In our inaugural year, we had seven athletes make it down to the state level. And at the state level, everyone received either a gold or silver medal. So for year one, we thought that was pretty good. Um, from there, we travel right into basketball. Um, our basketball teams, we have two of them. And our blue team this year made it to the state competition where we took second in state. So again, we were very happy with their achievements there. Um, also, uh, during basketball, this was our third year doing um, a fundraiser that we give back to the community. We're constantly asking for everyone to support us. And so we find a way every year to give back to the community. So through the Christmas sharing program, we had a pack the gin night. And this year, again, was one of our most successful. We were able to give back to the community close to $800 um, that we raised. And we also filled a box truck full of food to give to local um, churches to give out to those in need during the Christmas season. So we were very happy about that. Um, we also then move in in the midwinter to our bowling season. Um, this year we have five athletes going to the state or the next level, the sectional level for bowling, which will take place in November. So we were happy with their efforts there. And we also start our track season. Um, during track season, um, we typically have quite a few athletes that make it down to state, but because they, we did so well in bocce and you can't compete in two sports at the state games, um, we, we kind of had a, a smaller number this year and we only had one athlete make it to the state level um, for track this year. But, very proud of all the uh, athletes and all their accomplishments and their hard work. Um, a lot of our athletes are four sport athletes. And so they're going year round in addition to um, some sports and different activities they do with Wedstra. So we're happy with their achievements and happy with what they're doing in school as well. Um, our biggest fundraiser of the year um, was our Bolathon. Um, this year was year two, and again, after the, the great year we had in our first year, um, I thought, how are we going to top that and, and make more money? And, and again, the community came and, and supported us tremendously, and we raised about $4,000 for our program uh, through that, that fundraiser. And all of that money goes right back to the athletes. It's how we support the athletes with their uniforms, with um, supplementing travel costs when needed, tournament fees, and all those different things. So we're really proud of the fundraising that the athletes are able to do um, to help sustain our program so that um, we can kind of 
use our own funds to, to do what we need to do. So we're very proud of all the athletes, happy with all their accomplishments, um, and ready for a, another great season as we start to move forward. So thank you guys very much for all of your support, um, coming out to our events and coming to our fundraisers, and we appreciate everything. Thank you guys. Can you guys all stand up, athletes, real quick? Stand up. Man, stand up. We have athletes from the middle school level all the way up through transition and on average every year we have about 25 to 30 athletes in the program. So again, great job guys. Mr. Ferguson, could you please introduce their names and then have them come around and we'll shake their hands <coughs> and we'd just like to congratulate them on their successes. Absolutely. All right. We have uh, Ryan Zima, Arturo Carmona, Lily Peckinpah, Amanda Lebowski, Abby Russin, Rod Hooten, and Sean Doran. We also have we also have a number of peer partners and um, other staff who help coach with us. Cameron Huffnagel is here with us tonight. She's a teacher over at Wheaton. And again, congratulations to all of our athletes and their families that are here this evening supporting them. We do uh, always value your success and certainly representing District 200. So thank you very much and good luck, especially the bowling team who's got more coming up in the near future. So again, congratulations. I know Mr. Ferguson has certificates for you that he's going to pass out to you out in the hallway. And uh, thanks again for coming. You can stay in the board meeting if you'd like, but certainly uh, I know you may have other things going on as well. Uh, and Mr. Ferguson does have certificates on behalf of the board. So again, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. to the public comment uh, section of our meeting. And there are three people who have signed up for public comments on agenda items. Uh, I, I would like to let you know that the opportunity to speak to the board is provided now at this time for members of the public who have a question or comment on an agenda item. The board appreciates hearing from our stakeholders and your thoughts and questions are valued. The board strives to make the best decisions in, for the district and public input in a variety of venues is very helpful. As president, I bear the primary responsibility for protecting the civility and decorum of this meeting. In this regard, I request respect for the duties of the board and the democratic process in your comments tonight. Please use the microphone and announce your name and address before commenting. Please limit your comments to three minutes. Address your comments to the board. Your comments should be factual and courteous and should not include statements that are personally disrespectful to members of the board or staff. And comments that are deemed personally condescending will not be permitted. If you feel your matter needs to be discussed in more detail, please attend the board's chance to chat or present your comments to us in writing. And the first person who has signed up is one else. Is it Sappho? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you see it turn on, it'll take just a, about five or six seconds to register. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the board for allowing me to speak tonight. My name is Lionel Sappho. I'm employed with SEIU Local 1. My address is 111 East Wacker Drive, Chicago, Illinois, 60601. I'm here today to 
Uh, one, thank the board again for allowing us to speak and address this uh, very important matter that we'd like to bring to your attention. Recently, we're in contract negotiations with the contractor GCA service group whom you've hired to provide custodial services here in the Wheaton School District. And in those negotiations, we were informed that, one, that there would be no health insurance uh, for these individuals. They were receiving health insurance up until July 31st. And those health insurance uh, payments were taken away. Two, they are not gonna receive a wage increase, which is this is the fourth year that they have not received a wage increase. These are the families and their kids and their children who keeps all the, oh, excuse me, who keeps all the schools clean, who does the, the dirty work, but at the same time provide a safe, clean environment for the kids, faculty, and administration to teach. And we're just here today, humbly asking you before you approve your tentative budget tonight to talk to GCA, provide health insurance, provide a wage increase. Because these are the individuals in this room, this facility, and the other schools, the cleanliness, the hard work, to rid it of any disease. These are the people that do the work. And they're here today to beg and plead that you all reconsider and possibly redirecting some funds in order for them to receive insurance. Now, we all are aware that January 1st, there's supposed to be a mandate on companies to provide health insurance for their employees. It's called the Affordable Care Act. And to have your insurance taken away six months prior is devastating to a lot of these individuals. My three minutes are done, but I would like to call up Pedro. He's one of your janitors. He's on the list. And he would like to express to you all, because he has some pre-existing conditions, not having insurance now, it's going to put him and his family in a terrible hardship. So I'll let PJ, I mean, I'm sorry, Pedro. Mi nombre es Pedro. He estado trabajando por el distrito por 12 años. El distrito escolar Huito 200 puede hacer mejor y tenemos que fortalecer nuestra familia de la escuela, dar, no darle la espalda a ellos. Custodias como yo son padres de niños de edad escolar en Huito. Mantenemos la escuela limpia, segura, pero qué pena dar lo suficiente. No nos dan suficiente para nuestro, mantener nuestras familias, construir una vida mejor. No hemos tenido un aumento en cuatro años. Y ahora, a partir del primero de junio, mi atención médica se la ha llevado. Ahora yo no puedo comprar mis medicamentos. Tengo que tomar dos vacunas por semana para controlar mi alergia que cuesta alrededor de 80 dólares por semana. Eso es aproximadamente la cuarta parte de mi ingreso mensual. Esto no está bien. Hacemos un llamado a la Junta invertir y proteger a los trabajadores de nuestras escuelas y al futuro de nuestros hijos y nuestra comunidad. I'll translate. My name is Pedro Bahina and I've been working with the district for 12 years. Wheaton School District 200 needs strong schools to take care of its families and not turn back, turn their back on them. Custodians like me are parents of Wheaton School children. We keep the schools clean and safe, but we barely make enough to support our families and build a better life. We haven't had a raise in four years. And now, as of July 1st, my health care was taken away. Now I can't afford to buy my medication. I have to take two vaccines per week to control my allergies, which cost me about $80 per week. That's about the fourth of my monthly income. 
this is not right. We're calling on the board to invest and protect our schools, workers, and the future of our children and our community. In closing, I just want again uh, ask the board to, as you go through your tentative budget approval process tonight, to revisit the contract with GCA services. And again, they informed us that these cuts were mandated in the RFP that was, uh, I guess, that went out earlier this year, and that they could not provide health insurance for these individuals who were currently receiving health insurance. Now they don't have insurance, and again, four years, four years running, especially during a the recession, they have not had a raise. And we believe, like I said, he's a 12-year employee. He's dedicated, he loves the school, he loves cleaning for the school, he loves cleaning for the kids and the faculty. Now we're asking that the, the board look at these individuals and their families and make a decision to help them. Again, uh, I can leave my card if anyone wants to address these issues or get back with me. I would like to know who should I talk to and who would be the person I would follow up with. Because you did make a comment, ma'am, that if we have some concerns that we can also put it in writing. I would also do that. But I was asking, is there someone today that I can speak to that can address some of these concerns? Is there someone? Mr. Farley. Sure, we'd be happy to take it. Mr. Farley, our assistant superintendent for business services, be the other person to, to contact, and we can follow up. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. I do have one other person signed in. Carolina is. She's okay. decided not to. Okay. okay. All right. You could just leave your card with Ms. Lila. I can know right there. She's our director of public relations. She will get it to staff. Thank you. Very okay. Much. Thank you. Okay, are there any um, items that board members wish to clarify or that staff wish to clarify on public comment tonight? Okay, then we'll move on. Superintendent's report. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Intahar, and, and good evening, board members. Uh, first of all, I uh, and not only to the board, but also to our audience here this evening, I want to uh, congratulate you for navigating our construction uh, scenario out front. Um, the city of Wheaton has chosen to redo our streets and side, a little bit of a sidewalk and entryway, and um, I know the board is aware that we will be repaving this parking lot out here too. We worked with the contractor with the city and got a very reduced uh, opportunity to be able to resurface our parking lot as part of that, which has not been done in many, many, many years. So. Um, we uh, uh, certainly are working here in this building as staff, uh, working through that on a daily basis, never quite know which, where to park when we show up. So thanks for everybody uh, navigating that to here this evening. Um, just two items this evening on the superintendent report. One of them uh, is a follow-up from the last board meeting, which is the Jefferson Life Safety Update. In your green folders this evening, you will see a two-page document that uh, our architects have updated on the outstanding life safety issues. These are just the issues that are still remaining at that particular school. Um, and I would uh, ask you to draft at this point. It will be a final document um, soon. If you have any questions or concerns on that document, please let me know and we will follow up with our architects. Um, and at the next uh, board meeting in August, then we will bring this back. Um, we do have to file an extension with the DuPage County um, that, uh, asking for until we determine how we are going to address these. So as you see on there, we, uh, we certainly uh, still have uh, approximately $1.7 million worth of life safety issues at Jefferson as it stands today. Um, so we will be asking for that extension at the August meeting. Any qu quick questions at this point, if you want to take an opportunity to look it over, you can certainly do that and get back to me um, at your convenience. Any quick questions on that item? I just wanted to point that out. My only kind of would be, just a quick look at it, Malachima would be the 1.7 million that would be the construction cost. Yes. If we actually went through with an actual budget, we'd have to add contingency uh, costs associated with that. Absolutely, and that's that. This document is prepared with, uh, in relation to the state requirements. You are correct, Mr. Paulson. So it would be more than that. That's correct. We're talking about extension. Uh, is there a, a timing that uh, these events must be completed? The state, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong here, Mr. Farley, but the state allow, uh, requires us to complete these within three years. The original uh, um, um, 
uh, document was uh, presented to the county in 1992. Um, so it has been a long-term extension. Each year we have extended those life safety issues based on um, the uh, funds available and the, and the process that we were going to do to remediate those and address those issues. So it has been extended uh, for each year since 1992. Um, and that is under school code. We are allowed to do that through grandfathering provisions uh, based on funds and allocations available to, to rectify those issues. Mr. Farley, anything to add to that? I get it correct? All right. What, what is the yellow? A few of them are highlighted in yellow. I'll turn to Mr. Farley on that. Do you know, Bill, what, what those particular issues are? I don't recall off the top of my head. I think they were uh, some prior prioritization there is what I thought they were. I did not read the entire document there. Um, I can certainly get back to it unless Mr. Farley has a quick response on it. I'm not sure. I don't want to misspeak. Anything, Ms. Farley, are you sure? I'm looking right now. I just want to verify what you think it is. While we're waiting, the, uh, just to understand this document one, one further step. This is a presentation, again, it's about a $1.672 uh, million dollar, uh, uh, proposal. Uh, it's a draft, and we're going to address this in the next meeting. And what are we addressing specifically? The extension of it, or, or are we considering the cost of this, or what are we doing? No, we will, uh, the board needs to approve an extension that we will then file with the DuPage County. That, so it's really the extension. It's just we we updated it. The original document had outdated numbers, and we updated this document. So this is what our architects have done. They went through and, and cleaned it up and, and have updated it. So those are uh, 2013 numbers at this point. We've also, from the original document, we have addressed several of the issues So uh, over time. But these are still the outstanding ones. These are just condition modifications that have occurred since the original amendment. Condition modifications that have occurred since the original amendment was filed. Okay, so added two items. Any other questions about this? And if you do have further ones, if you get a chance, please follow up, and I'll be certainly happy to address that. If we do need to have architects here at the next meeting, we certainly could do that as well. Okay. All right, the second item this evening is, um, do have uh, uh, some guests here this evening that I will introduce in just a minute, and it's in regard to a gift that is being um, offered to District 200. Um, on every board agenda that I can remember, we always accept gifts. Some of them range uh, from very small amounts, so some of them are, are larger. This particular gift is a significant gift, and as far as a financial gift. And um, a little background before I introduce the gentlemen that are here this evening. Um, several months ago in the spring, to early spring, um, they approached the administrative staff at Wheaton North High School as parents of the school, um, asking about how they might be able to uh, provide a gift to the school to replace um, some bleachers and redo some of the gym, the gym floor and some of those items that we have identified on our capital improvement list um, as needs by the school district. And I had several conversations with Ms. Bullo and Mr. Fisher at Wheaton North. Um, my, Mr. Farley and I joined that discussion um, shortly after that, and I believe we've met three uh, times, talked on the phone a few times, and talked about some of the details of what this gift uh, would look like. Um, and tonight, they are here this evening to talk about the details of the, the resources, the source of the, of the funds to pay for this particular item, and a little bit of uh, information behind it. I ask the board to please listen to the details and certainly be asking for some guidance as we move forward because we are going to accept this gift. There are uh, some timelines here that we do to meet and I'll be talking about a few of those. So at this time, I'd like to introduce the three gentlemen here. Uh, first of all, Mr. John Kirschbaum right here on the front, Mr. David Coolidge, and Mr. Eric Pierce. So gentlemen, if, uh, whoever's going to be speaking, you'll have to speak into the mic so it is recorded. And uh, they have a short slide presentation that is in your green folder. Uh, and they're going to walk through it with you some of the details about their proposed gift to District 200. Mr. Coolidge. Slide all the way up, just a second. 
So good evening and thank you Dr. Harris and esteemed members of the board. Um, thank you for precious time on your very busy agenda this evening. Um, I am David Coolidge and uh, actually this is the second time I've been in front of the board with a charitable donation uh, in the last 18 months. Uh, the last time was in February of 2012 where I was uh, proud to donate $25,000 towards STEM programs at uh, District 200 schools on behalf of Bosch, my employer at that time. Uh, tonight I'm here to represent, as Dr. Harris said, a, a much larger, more significant uh, donation and gift. Um, tonight I'm here representing the friends of Wheaton North Public Schools, and I'm here with two of my friends, uh, John Kirschbaum and Eric Pierce. Um, All right, there we go. So, uh, Friends of Wheaton North Public Schools is a newly formed 501c3 not-for-profit uh, organization, and it has been founded to support the needs of Wheaton North High School, working together with the school district and with the administration. The objective of our organization is to provide learning environments and facilities which are state-of-the-art in regards to science, languages, core curriculum, the arts, and sports. To be clear, these endeavors will be funded by privately sourced funds. To be clear, we are not here asking for funds from the school board. Now, over the course of the time that we've been collaborating with Dr. Harris and others uh, on his staff, um, we have compiled a list of projects, potential projects, mostly from the parents and citizens viewpoint. We do seek further input from students, uh, school administration, and staff in regards to other potential school needs going forward. But tonight we're here specifically to present and explain uh, the first project that we would like to pursue. And that first project is a remodeling and rehabilitation of the Nips Gym at Wheaton North High School. And here to provide more of those details is my friend, John Kirschbaum. John. Thanks, Dave. Um, good evening. We appreciate the time, and we'll just try and get through this as quickly as we can. Uh, over the last few years, I've been very fortunate to have four children go through Wheaton North, and one of the issues that continually has been a problem is the gymnasium, the bleachers specifically. Uh, back in January, we had a little conversation about, gee, couldn't we get that taken care of? And through the help of my two friends and some other folks, uh, we've put together a plan that we think will benefit the school district, benefit the athletes, and of course the students as a whole. Um, it would be our intent to provide a new bleacher system, change, or I should say refinish and rehab the existing wooden floor, and add new wall pads. Uh, this is a significant project and you're looking at approximately $340,000. Um, although fundraising is well underway, um, I will tell you we have had some great uh, folks come forward and give us some significant dollars pledge and actually uh, in a couple of situations checks in hand and we're ready to move forward with this project 98% uh, funded as we stand here today. What that basically means is, and we're seeking the board's approval, uh, so we can start actually in October right after homecoming it would require the gymnasium to be closed through the end of November. We would be refinishing the floor, new set of graphics. And I'm sorry this came so late, but if I could ask you to take one and pass along, there's a typical of what the floor might look like. It hasn't been approved by Ms. Boulot or Mr. Fisher yet, but this is just kind of a visual so you get kind of a feel for it. And in addition, uh, we would look to uh, establish new bleachers. Uh, it would bring it up to a state-of-the-art product that is electric, easy for the maintenance people to put out and uh, re uh, retract in, and of course it would give it a nice, clean, complete finish. We are unfortunately losing a little capacity in the gymnasium because of the new life safety codes, and uh, it does remove, can I tell you, maybe you can tell me, was it about 140? About 140 in capacity. It does give us some other advantages, and we can talk about that in a more detailed situation if you're interested. We do have a timeline starting in October, two weeks to remove the existing. Uh, we're looking at three weeks then to refinish the floors, 
and then about three and a half weeks to install the new product. So the week of November 25th, we would be finished, complete, and out, so basketball could get started on time. Now, I will tell you very honestly, we have hedged that just a little bit, because anything that can go wrong will go wrong, so we're being a little bit on the conservative side. Um, just so you're aware, uh, the product, uh, we have negotiated contracts with people that provide these kinds of products. Uh, we would provide the Wheat District 200 as a co-insured on the program itself. We would actually hold the contract until it's complete, and then the ownership would be turned over to the school district in its entirety, transferring all the necessary uh, authorized and instruction manuals, warranties, and so forth. Uh, one of the interesting things is they do come in and actually train people so they don't just turn them loose with the product, and we think it's a reasonable opportunity. Uh, right now we are finalizing the project plan, we are finalizing the rest of the fundraising, and of course we have been in communication with Dr. Harris and his staff, and they have been terrific to work with, and we really appreciate them. At the back side, you'll notice there are some drawings, and I apologize when you take a architectural drawing and reduce it and then try and scan it. <clears throat> it looks a little funny, and I apologize. We certainly will provide full-size drawings. And for the architect in the room, Mr. Paulson, please don't you know, beat me up about it. <laughs> but it does give you kind of an overview. It shows you some elevations of what the bleachers will look like, and then a uh, side uh, view of the bleachers. And one of the things that we think is significant is uh, handrails on every bleacher now are self-storing. They can never be removed. They can't disappear. And now we won't have people falling up and down bleachers. So it's a huge safety issue for you as well. With that, let me just suggest to you that uh, our attorney and our friend is here. If you have any questions about the organization itself, Eric is more than happy. Mr. Kalibs has been a huge leader in this whole situation. I appreciate his time. And we're certainly willing to take questions. Let me just comment a couple things um, uh, for the board. You know, one of the things that we, um, uh, when we look at this type of gift, it's pretty significant planning. It's a, it's obviously a significant donation. Um, both of these items, the, the gym floor and the bleachers, have been identified on our capital list. I mentioned that one time before. Um, we currently do not have a funding strategy for them, although we've identified that they need to be replaced. Um, and the other piece here is uh, the district's exposure on this particular thing. There's really two items. One of them being we just have to, uh, our architects do have to approve any, any final drawings and so on so that you know, we would have some architectural piece that we do with any type of project. And we also would have the liability um, component you know, during the, the construction situation. So I know several board members are very familiar with that. So that's the district's exposure there and that very typical in any projects that we you know, pursue. Um, so that's just a couple follow-up items that Mr. Farley and I have been working on as we've looked at the scope of this. And uh, what I would ask that, uh, if the board members have any questions at this point, um, if this project is going to move forward, we would have to have some board approval at the August board meeting uh, for the, to accept the gift, basically, is what it would be. And, they would, and then we would take it from there. Um, I have worked directly with Mrs. Bull and Mr. Fisher, and we do believe that it's doable. Um, certainly when you do projects during the school year, there's always some challenges, so I'm not going to dismiss that. There would be some uh, during the day as well as uh, after school challenges, but we certainly can, can make it work. Mr. Fisher uh, said he'll get started when he's directed, so um, of reorganizing some things. So if there's any questions, certainly um, staff, we can talk about it. Uh, gentlemen are here to speak on behalf of this group of parents. I'll turn over to the board for any questions or comments. A point of clarification, Dr. Harris. Um, I'm glad, of course, that our architects have to approve everything so we know it's going to be up to code and everything like that. With respect to liability issues, uh, John, I would assume that uh, you folks would have insurance and we would be uh, co insured or additional insured under those policies. So Actually, the insurance would be handled by the uh, manufacturer's rep and the installers. Uh, the Friends of Week North would be a co insured as well as District 200. And then uh, you mentioned that. With, you would then hand over all the warranties and indemnities. They will be assignable by the manufacturer Correct. to us. Uh, Absolutely. The restrictions are here. Yeah. Well, as a past Wheat North parent, I am just hot and amazed and can't thank you enough. That is, it's huge that you, you know, recognize it, stepped up, 
fundraise and then to go out and just to do all the work for the district and, and I mean it's absolutely mind-blowing and I can't thank you enough I am excited to see it and I know the students and staff are going to be thrilled thank you so much and I should mention I think I did but uh, Ms. Fulo, Mr. Fisher, Dr. Harris have been invaluable to our process and we appreciate the work that they've done so uh, although we may be here they've been a big part of this making it Uh, a couple of items. So number one, uh, I just want to make it clear these were on our plan to be dealt with in the future and unfortunately with the funding of education in today's world it's uh, difficult to achieve these and it's great to see, uh, I don't know, it's great to see this being funded this way but it's greatly appreciated that, that you know, this effort's been put forward. Uh, just a couple of minor questions on uh, if, is, what if uh, this took an extra month? How would that disrupt the world on how much so and I, you know you mentioned we have a contingency plan in there but you know again I think that there's obviously this is used for classroom activity as well and you know how do we concern ourselves with that when we said and we uh, when I was working with uh, Ms. Bullo and, and Mr. Fisher about that uh, that was a concern uh, and um, you know obviously during the school day it is a classroom it is PD space so we do have those concerns one of the reasons why we bumped it back past homecoming at Mr. Polo's request is that facility gets used significant during that week with all of the activities so it actually the timing between the athletic seasons after school is a good time because we're in between the fall and the winter seasons there. now there is some conflicts I don't want to minimize that Mr. Fisher made that crystal clear in our discussions they will have to re fortunately we have the field houses and we would at the other gym and we will be able to relocate those it will be far from ideal but i think the payoff you know will be there uh, if we were to have to extend it uh, we would be talking about three weeks from the thanksgiving break to the winter break um, so it, hopefully you know that would be a three additional weeks there we would be able to wrap any you know unforeseen things up over the winter break which gives us you know to the first week in january you know that's the outside chain. you never know when you start remodeling you just don't know until it happens although this particular project with bleachers and the gym floor seems pretty standard it, there there isn't a lot of unforeseen there but you never say never so. okay. well i just I want to say thank you for, for your efforts and thank you in particular for um looking at what the needs are within the district and working with that i think that is you know there's a million things that people could wish for and dream for and it's good that we're focusing in on things that support our programs that support our education so i pre very much appreciate that aspect of it and uh, i'm sure that Ms. Bullough will think this is a great great finale here for you <laughs> So, quick question: Are we looking at doing this work during the school day, or <clears throat> yes. during the school day? Yes, I believe some. Uh, but, although we did talk about some second shift scenarios, depending on what's going on. So some of the work would be during the day. We would have to be very conscious of that. And I know this. The contractors will be working with the building staff to coordinate that. So, like for instance, when we bring in the, we talked about the big bleacher pieces. That can't happen during the day, so that's going to have to happen in the evening or after outside of school hours. So it's kind of situational, and I know you're familiar with those types of projects. So um, we'll have to work with staff on that to make sure it's a safe environment. <coughs> yeah, I was just thinking about um, safety during the school day. <coughs> Excuse me, as well. As <clears throat> environmental issues we obviously <clears throat> let me see if I can help a little bit <laughs> um, we certainly have some issues uh, obviously the rehab of the floor is going to be the dirtiest part of that uh, we've already had in contact in fact the, uh, the uh, folks that are going to do their stalker floors out of Wisconsin they are by far the, by far the premier a refinisher in the country they've been MBA courts they've been major universities uh, he actually has been in twice looked at the facility uh, we feel comfortable that we can reduce the amount of dust and so forth they'll be doing large vacuums we'll be sealing off every place that we possibly can we're going to ask obviously uh, the administration there to keep doors locked as much as we possibly can so uh, will it be easy no it won't 
Uh, but we're uh, confident, and I've got a little over 30 years of experience of doing these kinds of projects, so it makes it easy for me to uh, tell you, you know, there's always going to be something wrong. It's not if there's going to be something wrong, but how we address it. And uh, the folks that we're working with have the reputations in the industry not to let their people down. So from that point, you know, we are going to have bleachers going out. We're going to have bleachers coming in. There's wood, there's steel. Well, you're dealing with the best possible installers in the uh, state of Illinois without question. Well, thank you for anticipating my question. <laughs> <laughs> Been there before. Mr. <laughs> Curley, you have something to add? I just comment that if the board recalls we, our high schools have been through major renovations while school is in session. Uh, back we Marble South specifically had some pretty significant renovations like that while students are in session. So the district is familiar with doing these types of projects while school is in session. We'll obviously be very mindful of that as this project goes forward. I got my legal questions and insurance questions out of the way, John. As a retired lawyer, I can't help myself sometimes. But I wanted to make sure I thanked all of you for the great gift that you're giving our school. This is wonderful. And just as a this is a new 5013C, uh, we hope to be back to do some additional projects for you in the future. Um, just because we do have some t and timelines, and I'm not asking you to do anything official, but could you just kind of shake your head yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can tell you, John, by some of the questions here, I don't want to speak for other board members. I see a favorable response here, although if board members, if there are any questions or concerns afterward, please let me know. Um, I'll certainly get back to you, and we'll, uh, we will plan on uh, you know putting that gift uh, on the August board meeting, unless there are any other questions or concerns that come up. Can I comment about the the location, for those of you unfamiliar with the actual inside of Wheat North, the location of the gym is about the best location you can have for student safety. Because that is definitely um, my concern, student safety and noise impacting the other learning environments. The gym is pretty isolated um, and they assured me that they would seal it off. And so I don't have any more concerns because, trust me, I had a lot of questions, uh, but we're all good now, and everybody's happy, so it, I, we believe it'll work, and um, if it goes past Thanksgiving, it will cause Matt Fisher a few gray hairs, but considering the gift, we're willing to do whatever work it takes to make this work. So. Thank you, Ms. Paul. As I had mentioned, I've got 30 years of experience doing this. I will give you my personal guarantee that we did the 25th. We'll be out there in February. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Thank to make sure that what you're doing is in line with our educational purpose and, and something that is truly befitting and appropriate for a high school and we, we really appreciate that. Uh, the only question I have, and I think I know the answer to this, is uh, are there going to be any changes to our maintenance costs um, down the road? Any, anything significant, will the, you know, will the bleachers cost more per year to keep running or the floor more to keep in shape, anything like that? I'll let Mr. Farley answer that, at least from his perspective. Well, we, we do routinely have our bleachers inspected, so the mechanical function may have a different uh, component to the inspection process, but we'll, uh, you know, from a maintenance standpoint, and pulling bleachers out, they're all done manually, so this will uh, reduce time uh, custodian spend, it'll reduce risk of injury and other issues, and uh, make it a lot easier for uh, use, so I, I would say it's good for cost. With the 12-year, Pardon me, with the 12 year warranty on the bleachers, I wouldn't anticipate any significant costs related to bleachers. Floors, uh, actually, we're better off going into the uh, late fall, early winter humidities out of the building, and the urethanes, actually, with uh, controlled humidity and temperature, do much better. So, there, it should actually be a much better board. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Our pleasure. Dave, anything else? Eric um, Gentlemen, appreciate you being here. We'll be in touch. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We'll make our leave. Yeah. At this uh, concludes the superintendent's report. Oh, one other quick thing. Just a reminder to the board, maybe this isn't how you were going to say this. 
Um, August 12th, we are having our uh, team building session. Just want to remind the board with our facilitator from the Illinois School Board Association. So more information will be coming up. It's a Monday night. Uh, we will be doing our, our board workshop. Board self-evaluation. Yep. Okay. That concludes the superintendent's report. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Harris. Okay. okay, so now we have our, we're coming to the point of our consent agenda, and uh, we have several items uh, on the agenda. First is acceptance of a gift to Whittier School, acceptance of a gift from Microsoft, approval of revised policy 7.350, access to student records, approval of the renewal of discovery education streaming, Approval of revised policy 3.60, general school administration. Approval to renew Scantron achievement series. Approval of employee benefits consulting renewal. Approval of temporary construction easement agreement with DuPage County for Bower Elementary School. Approval of a resolution authorizing intervention and property tax assessment appeals. Approval of the print shop paper bid. Approval of the zero graphic bond paper bid. Approval of request for proposal for electric contract. Approval of waste and recycling services contract bid. Approval of security cameras and door access bid. Approval of the IASB annual dues. Approval of NSBA dues for the 2013-14 school year. Approval of the 2013-14 LUDA membership dues in LUDA is Large Unit District Association. Approval of bills payable and payroll. Approval of minutes June 12, 2013, open and closed, and approval to destroy recordings of closed sessions prior to February 2012. Approval of personnel report to include employment, resignation, retirement, and leave of absence of administrative, certified, classified, and non-union staff. Are there any items board members wish to remove from the consent agenda? Uh, if not, may I have a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Mr. Okay. Any discussion? I had submitted a question to Dr. Harris about the temporary easement at Bowers School and that it didn't provide for the county to provide any advance notice to, this, uh, to Bauer in the event they wanted access to the easement. Uh, if anybody has reviewed that, I doubt it has. Um, I understand it's just normal operating procedure for the county to provide that advance for so there is coordination of activities. And so I'm, I'm pleased with that response and that Any other comments or questions? Mrs. Tanya. I just had a question. Um, This is our main one that's, that um, we use to support K-12, pre-K-12, um, multiple, you know, thousands and thousands of video clips that, you know, we, we have, you know, used that service that they categorize them all. It's kind of like back in years ago where the, with the film service, you know, with the 8 millimeter, it's, now it's all online, it's all digital, and they are our main provider here uh, to use this. Now, we do have web access, and I will tell you the number one site that gets used in our school district is YouTube. So, I mean, there's all types of, um, you know, on our web services, you know, we, we use a variety of resources. This is the main one, though. Discovery Education categorizes and lines everything up for us, and staff use it significantly. And they update it all the time? Constantly, and that's, it's a real-time type thing, and it's updated. I miss anything else? Or is there any other product that we have that sits somewhere to this? No, we have about seven other online resources we use, but their product, their cost is a little lower than the level we have to take to the board for approval. So they're still in yearly renewal, but they're in the twelve or $13,000 range. You know, they have a little bit less service. They're not video service. This is the main video and image service. And I can say, because I looked at it today, knowing that there might be a question, every school logs in every week, except for there was one week, one school did it, and it was a actual holiday break week. So even during weeks of winter break, every someone from every school logs in to Discovery Ed. Track all of that if anyone would love it. <laughs> well, actually, and I, you know, I stop in a classroom sometime once a because I just it has to make education so much more interesting and visual and exciting compared to that just plain textbook. The use is usually two to three minutes. It's usually short, right. you know, or short term stuff. It's not long, you know, long 
service things, point of instruction. <coughs> so, thank you for the question. And just a little clarification on the history for new board members. Part of the issue here was copyright and the fact that even if you go online nowadays and pull something that you may think, oh, it's a TV show that you're seeing on Hulu, technically you have to get permission for it. So this allows our teachers, as I understand it, to use these materials legally as opposed to bootlegging them wherever those DVD bootleg cups are. <laughs> you don't have to worry about them. It keeps us clear of copyright violation. That's the bottom line. It's correct. Are there any other questions? Then, Mr. Senator, will you call for the vote, please? And board members vote online. Mr. Roman? Yes. Mrs. Cockhill? Yes. Mrs. Swanson? Yes. Mr. Gambiani? Yes. Mr. Paulson? Yes. I'm sorry. Mr. Matheson? Yes. Mrs. Intihar? Yes. I'm sorry, that was an operator error on my fault. <coughs> <coughs> Action items, um, approval of the 2013 <coughs> board votes. Do I hear a motion? To approve. Move to approve. <laughs> Mrs. Swanson? I second. Okay, Mr. Paulson seconds. Discussion. I have a, a number. Well, one general question I'll say, and this this also flows into the other uh, the other goals uh, that we discussed. Trying to, what what's the unit of measure on these? Uh, you know, I, I think again we have uh, a line. You know, for instance, the first one: line priorities and research to increase student and staff access to reliable technology. What what are we using as our goal or unit of measure, or how do we how are we going to uh, determine our achievement on these and or the other goals that we're going to be discussing? Shortly, I, I'm not clear on how we can make those determinations. Well, I'll take a first first crack at it. These particular goals that we're talking about right now are board goals, so they refer refer to our board processes and governance. And so, by definition, they're more or less usually process oriented tasks. So, in terms of having a unit of measure that we need to measure ourselves by. Perhaps there isn't one exactly like that. Just as an example, what you're talking about aligning with resources, uh, that will have to do with the budget. So in other words, once we feel assured among ourselves that the budget supports our goals and our intent for the student learning, in my way of thinking, that would say that that goal has been, has been met. So that's my initial answer to your question. Excuse me, I'll pay Mr. Paulson's uh, affliction right now. Sorry. <laughs> um, and I would, I would echo that sentiment uh, from Mrs. Swanson, and also what I what I took that to mean as well was not only providing a path in this coming school year, but also to provide a mechanism for perhaps, or looking into a mechanism this year for perhaps taking care of that for future years as well. That was my read when I read uh, that goal. So in other words, providing the environment for the staff to be successful. And the, the, the staff goal, we're, we're gonna have measurements on. So when, when we get those measurements, then we can reflect those up and say, okay, you know, if all the resources are aligned to the point where we're, we're being successful at the staff level, then We've achieved our goal. You know, one of, let me just jump in here a second too. I think one of the the issues here, you know, the budget certainly, you know, is a, is a point of discussion. You know, what it boils down to with with this particular topic is resources. It's revenue. It's it's about and it making expenditure decisions uh, with that revenue. 
I do think in the coming year, we are uh, going to have, the staff is going to be bringing some different options forward to the board, talking about where we go next when it comes to student access, when it comes to providing handheld devices, talking about professional development, as well as uh, in-classroom resources about integrating, you know, uh, digital uh, resources into the learning. And, um, you know, whether we talk about increasing fees, whether we talk about doing some type of a lease to own solution, which other districts, I know board members read a lot of other districts are doing that. Uh, we're, you know, freshmen coming into high school, get a machine for four years, they pay a flat fee up front. I mean, there's all types of different solutions. I don't want to get into that right now, but that's where, you know, we, we, I, we, we, staff would come back to this and say, okay, you know, here's, here's a topic, and we've got some, a recommendation or a variety of options to how to pursue. Uh, moving forward with um, different types of initiatives and how we might be able to generate resources. It also could be something working with uh, the community and looking for as a, as a gift or donations. We might start to pursue some things in different ways uh, through a foundation or I, I don't know at this point. Uh, trying to seek corporate partnerships. I mean, there's a whole range of things here uh, if, if I, as I think about it uh, with that particular target. So that's just from my lens. That's. Uh, where I see this as a board chart and goal. I guess, you know, what you just said is the, is the detail that I'd like to, you know, I want to see the section of the minutes that covers those topics, realistically, because it gives us a unit of measure, it gives us a timetable. I think, you know, uh, as you well know, I, I'm very concerned about our technology and what we spend on, and one of the challenges we have right now is implementing that today in the 13-14 budget, and you know, if we don't address these early in the process, you know, it's going to be challenging to do it in the 14-15. And you know, I, I think we, we really need to be addressing those items early enough, and, and specifically those kind of words is what you know becomes unit of measure. You know, so. so I think the evidence uh, would be through our board agendas, our discussions, our committee of the whole meetings, our topic, maybe our committee work. I'm not sure where that's headed, you know, and and those type of things. So I think that's where. Uh, you know, we need to work, we need to focus our efforts. So, Mike. I think as individual board members, we all want to have as a general goal to align our priorities and resources to increase student and staff access to reliable technology. But we also have countervailing goals we want to reach individually and to try to put a uh, a measurement on that when we have seven representatives of the community here at the table in board goals is very difficult and I would prefer the process goal so we know the general direction that we all want to go and then work collaboratively uh, in an effort to achieve that goal and so I, I endorse this approach. And I also think as as uh, board members are assigned to work on these different goals because I'm presuming we'll either assign individual members or teams of members or establish some ad hoc committees i think i think as they flesh out the whole the task at hand they will inherently be developing some uh, aspirations and goals for what they would like to see and then i would say the board would then be able to review that and agree disagree discuss whatever so i i'm comfortable with with the seemingly nebulous nature uh, at this point in time, and I think as you go through, then it becomes, you know, okay, how do I know if I did a good job? And and if you just put that in writing, uh, you know, I think that's that's where you're headed. I think it's the way you would want to know individually would be the same way the rest of us would would want to know. So I, I'm comfortable with it the way the way it is. I guess uh, the only comment I have based on that conversation is that I'd like to target a date, uh, the end of the first semester, uh, you know, February 28th, whatever, you know, that we kind of reassess these and say where are we at because of the end of the term, you know, comes into play there. So if these are 13 and 14 goals, I think we have to have enough time to achieve them and uh, well identify them and then achieve them. So, you know, I, I would like to, you know, as we move forward in this process, make sure that we address a time frame of, of reassessment. My suggestion might be that be a great topic for our August 12th workshop, where you know, we would have some discussion about that and what would be an appropriate time frame for the board and everybody think about that. That would be my suggestion. Okay, I think that, is that, is that okay? I'd love to, love to see that on that agenda. Okay, okay. 
And, and you know what, I, I'm thinking as you're talking, yes, I mean, every goal I ever had in my professional life had a date associated with it. And I guess I've become uh, comfortable with saying, well, by the end of next school year, but with the technology goal, we have, to, we have to be ahead of that curve because of when we do our budgets compared to when our year ends. So um, I think, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Just uh, in the process of developing these goals with uh, Rosemary, I was trying to look as part of the team very carefully at the district goals, if you've heard of it, not yet, four district goals. And as we develop these, recognizing that, that individually for the next calendar year or school year, they set up uh, you know, the, the follow up goal in 2014, 2015 that they're still consistent with the district goals, which are multi year goals high level. So I anticipate that these things will evolve year to year, grow, expand. Um, so there's no, not necessarily one definitive measurement at the end of this year and put it aside and go to something else. This is going to be a longer term <coughs> individual goal that I think will <coughs> benefit the district. <coughs> I, I tend to agree with that, except I think in a lot of these we have to have some sub goals and, and some real achievement along the way, otherwise they will be lifetime goals and, and I don't think that's acceptable. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a, any other comment? I'm oh, sorry, any other comment? Okay then, Mrs. Sender, will you call for the vote? Mrs. Swanson? Yes. Mr. Paulson? Yes. Mr. Vroman? Yes. Mr. Matheson? I just need to be clear. This is we're voting on the district polls only yes. right now? Yes. yes. Mr. Gambiani? Yes. Mrs. Cockhill? Yes. <coughs> Mrs. Inter R, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Motion oh, passes. Oh. We're missing Mrs. Cockhill. Wandered off. Uh-oh. -uh. No YouTube while you're sitting here. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Next, we have approval of the 2013-14 superintendent goals. Uh, do I hear a motion? So moved. Mr. Roman moves. Second. I second. Mr. Paulson seconds. Discussion. Uh, I would like to see units of measure in the school of these goals. Uh, I think these are much more critical in that they're tied to other components of the world and uh, you know I think we need to make sure we have you know good units of measure that we can judge these the performance on these goals. Okay, Mr. I, I agree with uh, with Mr. Matheson and I think what, we, what was attempted, if I may read into what you wrote, when you say identify the baseline, you're looking at the starting point, which is probably the ISAT scores that we don't have in hand yet, or what are you looking for, something? Well, I think as, as we discussed this with Dr. Harris, um, we, we said that, you know, actually, this is based on the uh, local assessments for the student achievement. And to some extent, you have to start getting some of that data in before you determine what it is that you need to grow, what you need to, what you need to look at in terms of saying that you are measuring some growth. Okay. So this will be based around those uh, local assessment scores. But in terms of are we going to say, is it a particular grade level that needs to grow? Is it a particular skill that needs to grow? Is it a particular um you know area uh, that the, the school that needs growth that we felt would be better left to dr harris and his team to look at those first group of assessments that come in and set themselves some baselines as to how exactly are we going to look at this so that we can see that there will be a, a measurement of growth so actually part of the goal is to set the measurement um, starting at the beginning of the year with those um, results. And then the same thing when it comes down to the, um, the what was the other goal down there? The, money? the, uh, technology. the technology. Similar the technology. type of. Similar type of thing that there would be a baseline that would be identified first 
and then we would be looking at. So the baseline would be identified early on, and if there you know needs to be some discussion about having a deadline as to when that baseline is identified, that might be something that people might want to contain. So those two goals, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Brad, but we felt like those two were very open to being measured uh, quantitatively, as well as whether or not the budget is balanced. I mean, those things just lend themselves to data and you can measure them. Some of the other goals that Dr. Harris has as milestones to support his contract uh, goals are, in fact, process goals much like ours are. For instance, establish a, a finance advisory committee. That's, that's a process goal. It's either established or it's not. Well, it's qualitative in nature, too. Right. You use the word quantitative. Right. A few of these things are very quantitative, and, and some of them are qualitative. Right. And, you know, you can provide evidence and research to support, you know, those in different ways. And so um, that's why we set it up that way. Um, and if there's questions about, you know, anytime you measure growth, especially in student learning, one of SB7, the new law is clear about the time student performance to certified staff performance evaluation. And you have to have a starting point, you have to have an ending point, whether it's a superintendent, whether it's a principal, whether it's a classroom teacher. It's the same thing, and you have to establish what those uh, points are, and you measure the growth over time. What's an expected growth, what happened, what didn't happen. So, and this is, the reason why this was chosen was we are implementing new K-12, or K-7, math curriculum and assessments and standards issued to the Common Core. And so that's why that particular target for this year was chosen because that's what we spent a lot of our time working on over the past year and a half. And the board approved it. We have new materials. We have pre-D going on. We're going to have assessments. We're going to have a starting point, any part, to be able to show and measure growth. That's why that particular thing. Can I describe it right now today? No. After the first quarter? Absolutely. We'll have our first set of data. Correct? Stump us. Uh, I'm not well mistaken. Well before the end of first quarter. Okay. And then we'll be able to, whatever point, you know, if it's February, March, whatever, you know, we have different points along the way where we're going to be taking those probes and measuring growth and, and finding out exactly what's going on. So, I mean, that's just an example of that particular one. There will clearly be quantitative data that will indicate where we sit in that particular arena. Okay, I, I just, again, as long as we are in a position, you know, contractually we have to evaluate performance uh, as part of the contract. And, and accordingly, I, I think I want to make sure that we are in a position to make that determination come um, whatever date that determination has to be made. And that, that, that's the critical issue. I think that was the offshoot of the whole contract performance. And we're heading that same direction in the, in the teacher performance down the road. So, right. you know, that, that really is, uh, you know, a key to these that they are quantifiable and measurable so we can address those issues. And if I understand correctly, Dr. Harris, with respect to some of the process goals that are identified here, for example, um, the goal to investigate, evaluate, and recommend virtual learning opportunities for all students, you and your staff are just beginning that process, and uh, uh, there are all sorts of virtual learning opportunities you need to assess and evaluate Absolutely. and consider, perhaps discard some before you present them to the board as options. Which uh, we know one we won't be using. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I assume that's also the case with the seeking and selection partnerships with uh, higher education institutions to provide administrative leadership, which ties into our goal to have to develop our staff and to retain our staff. Uh, and we've talked previously, and, and we're going to explore this more, I guess, um, the community engagement process uh, that uh, we hope to implement to become to engage the community and get their ideas on a wide variety of topics as well. Uh, but that's something we will be looking to you during the course of the year to present to us. Talk about. I would look forward to. I would look forward to the day that we, as a board, as a superintendent, as a, a teaching staff, uh, are totally accountable to the community and have measurable performance units that they can evaluate us on. I think it's very critical in the, in the long haul of what we, what we should be accomplishing. Go ahead, did you want to? Yeah, uh, well, maybe you want to go ahead and follow up first. Yeah, okay. And, and to follow, uh, it's after. And, and I, I totally agree with you 100%, and I, but I think where we are right now is we want to make sure 
that the measurements that we select make sense over the long term. Because if, if we, you know, just like with ISAT, the world was being measured with ISAT scores, and we know we can't measure the world with ISAT scores. It doesn't give the complete picture. So, so we want to make sure, and, and I think Dr. Harris and his staff agree, that we need to do what makes sense. And, and, and that's not something you could just kind of snap your fingers and say, oh, aha, here it is. So I, I think the more care we give to it, the better job we'll do long term. And, uh, but I totally agree with you. I, I don't think you could measure an entire district by a number, but there are certainly numbers that you can use that give you the impression that the district is performing well or not performing well. And I think that's what we're all after. But we don't want to use a measurement that doesn't make sense in this, you know, with the scenario where we have just new common core curriculum. We have a lot of things going on. So, but I, I, I agree with you 100%. I think you've just described some of the objections to uh, Senate Bill 7 and the challenges in front of Sport Reading. So, you know, I don't think we can back away from it. And uh, so, you know, it'll be the challenge of the board through the administration to make those determinations. Well, I was going to say, I'm really not one to want to just uh, change things willy nilly at the board table. But if, the, if Dr. Harris felt comfortable adding a line and saying, establish a baseline by the end of the first quarter um, just to say yeah we, we know that we're going to have a baseline by then and move forward um, I could support that as uh, addressing some of the concerns but on the other hand the whole, the whole point was to make sure that we got a good baseline so I don't want to impose an artificial deadline that won't get us the best way of moving forward I said that off the top of my head. <laughs> that way. Yeah, I'm, you know, I think it's very doable. I don't want to speak on behalf of staff. Uh, you know, they'll be working directly with me on this. Uh, you know, on, on those three things. Um, you know, the three that are quantitative in nature. The one, the student achievement one. Obviously, the um, reliability and stability. Tech, what I vision with that is having a matrix of multiple factors that determine where the reliability and stability sits. First quarter, I, you know, I'm a little hesitant there on that one. Student achievement, you know, um, you know, absolutely. And then the other one with the um, revenues and expenditures. You know, we do that quarterly now anyway. You know, we're, we're, we show trends and we follow that. I, you know, that should not be a problem because that's not any different than our current practice. Correct, Mr. Farley? I didn't look over there. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, so I don't see, you know, we, we have certain things that, we, you know, we're looking at there, too. Um, I, I don't have any problem with that. If that's the wishes of the board, and you know, certainly think we should be able to hit that target, at least establish what the baseline is. can certainly give the board updates as we go along. Mr. Benson? You have the red light on there. Oh, you can talk to me. Yeah. Oh, I can. Oh, yes, you good. can. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I'll mark that in my I, I, got the main, I got the main one here. Yeah, I think, again, I'm not looking for tonight or, or next week or next month to have the absolute unit I think ultimately we're going to be held accountable, whether it's the end of the year or whatever. And along the way, we have to make these decisions so that when we discuss performance, whether it be at the board level, whether it be at the superintendent level or whatever, we have criteria that we can evaluate and look back and say, was this achieved during the year in accordance with these goals? So I, I don't know that we have to truly identify today or in the near term, but I think we have to be in a position to look back at the right time to address all these items. So. I am very comfortable doing it mid-year. When I say mid-year, you know, prior to winter, because I would absolutely, I have no hesitation with that. It, and that would be all of them, not just one or two. I'm talking about, you know, give it more than mid-year, eight years where we're at in each one of these, and it's established where on a couple of those were the baseline sets. I mean, that would be okay too, whatever mid-year is. So, you know, I, I, I'm fine with that, if that's what the board's coming. I just have one. Um, comment about the creating a community finance advisory committee and um, um, I'm not sure you know discussions come into your mind and go out of your mind but I, I I'm not sure we want to do that now I I have thought that we have discussed that but then decided 
that um, uh, to wait and, and pull out of the community engagement process what kind of input the community might want to have whether that be uh, community members onto the existing finance committee or an advisory committee or some other way of getting community input into finance. I, I know we had discussed put, making a finance advisory committee last year, but, but then I thought when we talked about engagement, I thought we were, we were kind of heading down the path of you know, if we establish this committee and then the engagement process tells us we should gather input a different way, then we'll be establishing a committee and then expanding it and then maybe establishing something new. Um, so I'm not sure um, uh, I feel comfortable with keeping that advisory committee in there as a goal, especially if we don't understand, because I don't understand what the role of that committee would be. What, what I mean, what would they do? How would they function? What would they be? I to have a goal that says provide for community input and community feedback. You know, okay, but I'm not sure that a goal to establish a committee and what what's the what's the purpose of that committee? That's that's kind of where I am with that, and I don't know uh, how I how I uh, missed that in my notes, but I did not have that in my notes from our discussion uh, the night we talked about goals. Um, well, I don't, I don't know whether we had, whether we discussed it the night we talked about goals, but um, we, we did not talk about waiting until community engagement to learn something about the Finance Advisory Committee. The Finance Advisory Committee is really um, a service to the finance committee. In other words, it's a subcommittee. So it's not a separate committee doing a separate piece of work. It's something that the finance committee last year felt would be a good idea. And when I say finance committee, that's myself and Mr. Gambiani and Mr. Farley and, and his team and Dr. Harris, that it would be useful to us to have some outside eyes, perhaps experts, looking at uh, various financial pieces along the way. So this is not really for the, it, it, it's okay. not like maybe finance committees in the past have been where they've been gathered to address a particular problem. This would be an ongoing mechanism to assure and ensure that our financial look at things um, is, has been looked at with more than just a couple of perspectives. So I think that is where it comes from. Okay. And actually, uh, the Finance Committee has already started looking at a couple of different structures for that. And I, I think we felt pretty strongly that we wanted to have that. So it's the same as any committee wanting to establish a subcommittee. OK, so then why is it? OK, so it, I should have this. Uh, uh, <laughs> OK, so. So then, is it, is, is it, what would be the rationale then, if, and because your committee can establish any committee you want, right. what's the rationale then for having it as a superintendent goal? Well, we, obviously because he and staff are highly involved in that aspect of things. I mean, you know, there's the educational aspect and there's the monetary fiduciary aspect, and so they're highly involved, so it's not like, we're going to be establishing that committee without their input. It's right. going to require a significant amount of work on their part. So if it is going to be something where Dr. Harris is spending his efforts this year, then it should be something that is measured at the end of the year. I also think there's an opportunity for the Finance Committee to play a role in community engagement, depending on how that shapes, shapes out. The community engagement is a pretty significant uh, process that can impact all of this sure. and so I think having a community advisory or finance advisory committee could benefit that process depending on how it works out so I think that was part of the rationale as well all right well thank you for that because that helps my understanding because I know the learning and teaching committee has many subcommittees that we never even you know talk about at the board level so 
uh, but I'm not sure that <laughs> I'm not sure that that uh, you know I mean faith goes about her business and establishes those committees and, and Joanne and, and they do their thing so but if, if this is going to take significant effort from the uh, superintendent then okay, it's, you know, it's those committees though are primarily staff driven they are. this one would not be this is engaging the community I mean this is it's, it, yeah, with the board, you know, with the whoever's on the finance committee. So this is a little different than other superintendent work committees, or you know, that's the, I don't see you know other than possibly Bill and and maybe Maureen Zybrick, maybe another staff person in the business office. This will not be a staff dominated committee. This will certainly be more you know getting more community people engaged and understand where we sit financially in you know in district two hundred. I think this is a very critical item that we engage the community in understanding the challenges that we face as a, a school district. And uh, the input of them uh, is absolutely critical. And, uh, you know, maybe a modification of these words to consider or, you know, develop a mechanism to have input from, you know, would, would do that. But, you know, I really have no problem with the create and, you know, that may be uh, end of year creation or whatever. But, you know, without that communication with the community, that's something we, should, we have to do. And I couldn't agree with you more. I just was unaware that the that the finance committee had decided this was the mechanism they felt was appropriate for that input. So now that that's understood, I'm good with it. So this committee would be financial experts that are willing to work with you. That's the idea. Which is you know such a great concept. I'm trying to think of other situations. Like I so appreciate our two board members because to have someone totally finance, especially school driven and an architect. I mean, it's like our own personal advisory people. That was amazing. Uh, they just went right in. Um, you need a real estate question? It doesn't, think it, <laughs> doesn't come up a lot, but um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's other times that we need. I mean, we're making such big decisions that we need experts, but we should bring in, but it, it's a great, great idea. Okay. Just, just one final comment, between the board goals and the superintendent goals, we have 16 goals this year, and any business, that would be way too many. So we might have to add a few more meetings. Okay. It's gonna be a busy year. I think the, uh, you know, in response to your, uh, Joanne's comment, I, I, I really believe that we want to get the people that are going to support us by the vote to the ballot box. And I think a, a lot of those people may not be financial experts. They may be uh, uh, retired individuals. Uh, they may be uh, students uh, or people that don't have kids in school, people that attend uh, parochial schools. So I really think that's the people that we need to make sure we contact. You know, I, I think we have internally and, and externally enough you know, there is a good source of, of uh, uh, financial experts that we could hire if we needed to, but, you know, really, I think the people we want to make, you know, is the, what I'll call average citizen, whoever that is, so that we have a good cross-section that they understand what our big picture is, because they're the ones who pay us, you know, they're the ones or that pay somebody, not us, or against the board, obviously, <laughs> Thank but, you, for you know, that. yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I think, again, you know, when I think of a financial committee, that's the people that I would love to see made up of, the people that voted for or against the referendum, or, or people that have significant input on the changes or the things we're going to have to challenge or deal with in the pension costs or building costs and all these things. So, you know, I think that's really the goal. When I think of a committee, that's who I would like to see, a cross-section of the community. And that can be determined later, obviously, but that would be my thoughts. Well, and, and I think that's all discussion for the Finance Committee, and that's why it's one of Dr. Harris's goals is how to, or milestone goals, is how to kind of balance some of that out. Because while what you're talking about is true, I think another thing that we envisioned is to have a, a sort of a continual touchstone that people could say, you know what, we not only has you know, Mr. Farley looked at it, and the Board of Seven looked at it, but there's somebody out there that we know is, a, you know, a very well thought of banker who's looked at it, somebody who's a very well thought of investment guy who's looked at it, and, you know, maybe looks at our budget, looks at our audit, looks at, you know, those sorts of things to kind of say, yep, everything is, the, the ship is okay, you can, you can believe them when they say that. So that is a big part of the way this is being envisioned, but there could be components of that as well, but it would all, you know, again, fall under the auspices of the 
finance committee to try to balance out those those interests and it could be through the community engagement process we end up with committees like that in in other aspects of of our work including facilities including teaching and learning but okay so the it's, it's not something that i think should be restricted to finance but we may have a different mechanism not quite the the advisory committee set up that you envision for that so what was the committee we had though with uh, kind of a broad base of we had a finance committee right. did that just disappear mm -hmm. That was for a particular topic. It was part of me being here, and certainly, you know, that was you know to deal with cuts and reductions. And it was an ad hoc group, meaning it was not a continual expectation. There, it was to advise the board on their perspectives. Okay. 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 Is there any more discussion? All right, then, Mrs. Sender, will you call for the vote, please? And uh, board members, vote online. Mr. Roman. Yes. Mr. Paulson? Yes. Mr. Gambiani? Yes. Mrs. Cockhill? Yes. Mrs. Swanson? Yes. <coughs> Mr. Matheson? Yes. Mrs. Intohar? Yes. Motion approved. We have both. More plannings? Yeah. Ready for me. Lots. No problem. Looking forward to it. All right, the next item on our agenda is to uh, post, approval to post the 2014 tenant budget. I see Mr. Farley getting up. Okay. Yes, uh, Mr. Farley is going to uh, walk through the details of our tenant budget that we will be asking the Board of Education to approve tonight to post the budget uh, for public um, uh, review. And uh, I'm going to, at this time, turn it over to Mr. Farley. He's going to walk through details. Board members, you do have a copy of the presentation. Uh, there's two documents in your green folders. One of them is the actual presentation. The other one is the tentative budget. Okay? So he will be referencing both of these documents um, as he walks through it. Mr. Farley. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Uh, as always, I'd like to start this presentation by thanking uh, district staff, principals, uh, my colleagues at the table over there for helping in, in putting this budget together. Uh, I started nagging them in uh, February, March to start putting numbers together for me and uh, that increases as we get closer to May and June. So uh, appreciative to uh, staff for all of their assistance in helping craft this budget. Uh, I'm going to run through the budget calendar. Uh, back in January, the Board of Education authorized the uh, to prepare the 2013-14 uh, budget for this year. We do that annually. Uh, in January, we did our presentation on our budget forecast. That's the FPP model from PMA. We do that every year around uh, this time where we do our five-year projections based on the assumptions and uh, information that we have at hand. Uh, back a month ago, uh, I went through some preliminary budget information and you may hear some repetition in some of the discussion today uh, about some of the information I provided back then that, uh, as it's incorporated into this year's budget. Uh, today we're asking the board to approve to post the budget, budget as Dr. Harris mentioned. Um, we'll have a public notice that will go in the paper and uh, be on the website and we'll do a slide on that in a second. Uh, on September 11th, uh, we will ask the board to hold the public hearing on the budget at Dr. Sinterland Childhood Center. The budget has to be on display for 30 days after the board posts it before we can hold the public hearing. Our next meeting in August, I believe, is on day 28, so we will uh, we obviously move that um, hearing to the next meeting, which is the September 11th meeting. And then finally, on September 25th, we asked the Board of Education to approve the 2013-14 budget. So that's the budget calendar. Uh, uh, the budget process is a year-round process, but this is the formal steps that we take uh, each year uh, to get to this point and beyond. As I mentioned, we'll, uh, we'll put a public notice in the newspaper, uh, which is the Daily Herald, relative to the budget posting. It'll also be posted on our website and here at the uh, School Service Center. Uh, also, we'll have the budget, uh, we do send copies of the budget document to the, all the libraries in our communities, Wheaton, Warrenville, Winfield, and Carroll Stream, and we also post it on our website with the help of Mrs. Loyacomo. 
I'm going to run through some highlights uh, on the revenue and expenditure side uh, for this budget. Uh, this budget does include the impact of the 1.7% CPI. Uh, that was the CPI uh, that we found out about in January. It was incorporated into the model. Uh, we're using that for, uh, we will have that as part of the levy process here in December. Uh, but that CPI is 1.7. Uh, just one note on the CPI. We do track that index all year. Currently the CPI for 2013 is tracking at about 1.8%. Um, if the index they were to stay the same until the end of December, it would be about a 1.7% CPI again. So uh, again, a lot of times gasoline is an indicator of where the CPI will go. Right now it's tracking relatively low, uh, but we'll see where it goes. That's, that CPI doesn't impact this budget, but I just want to just update the board as, as we know, because the CPI has done some uh, interesting moves in the last few years that have uh, had an impact on our levy process. Tax levy distributions at the, in June, I mentioned to the Board of Education that we saw a uh, decline in our tax levy uh, distributions. Uh, we went from, uh, we used 99.8% of collection rate in our model and what we anticipate receiving each year, it dropped to 99.3 something. Uh, so we saw a drop, so we did take that into consideration for the uh, uh, for this levy moving forward. Uh, we're anticipating around a 99.6%. Uh, so we did make that adjustment on our budget, so uh, anticipate receiving a little bit less because of the distribution. Again, a lot of that is relative to uh, 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 assessment appeals by in the community. Uh, the Board of Education approved the uh, uh, intervention in these, uh, that process. Uh, just for edification for uh, all board members, we do intervene mostly in business-related uh, assessment appeals, those are the ones uh, that are usually can be more significant and it also shifts the burden on to on the homeowners when the, when the property appeals of commercial or uh, business properties are reduced. So we do uh, get involved in those bigger ones. I think what we saw a lot with this last one and we're working with uh, Gwen Henry's office to try and see if we get a list. Uh, they've never been able to provide one. They're working on doing that. And, uh, I think they heard from a lot of business folks and wanting to know uh, what were exactly what uh, the reduction was. I think it's mostly in the housing. A lot of people are obviously appealing their assessments. Uh, corporate personal property replacement tax. Uh, this is funded in the education and IMRF fund. If you saw, look through the budget document that was posted online, uh, that number was reduced uh, somewhat in the education fund. Uh, we did move a little bit more into the IMRF fund, but we are uh, budgeting down in that regard. Uh, as I mentioned at the June meeting, we, uh, we came in uh, better than we anticipated last year, and again, that was due to the April surprise where the state got that uh, influx of money relative to folks selling off capital assets back in, uh, in December of 2012 in anticipation of some tax law changes. Um, we're not sure where the impact's going to be this year. We don't think that it's going to be as good. Uh, we also are, have not received the estimate from the Department of Revenue. We do uh, monitor that, and they have not posted that as of yet, uh, so what that could be. So that number could change in the budget. Hopefully, I think uh, we're conservative of where we think we're going to be, and maybe we'll see uh, some improvement there, but uh, we're kind of hedging it. But we did move more corporate personal property replacement tax money into the IMRF uh, fund this year to help shore up that fund. Interest earnings continue to be somewhat abysmal. Um, uh, uh, the budget is, uh, shows, that, uh, shows that those numbers are low. We used to earn millions of dollars in interest earnings, and like everyone else, uh, when you're getting a 0.1 or a 0.2 percent, there's not a lot of money there. Mrs. Zyber does everything she can to uh, maximize our interest earnings, but again, there's still considerably down uh, over past years. General state aid, uh, as the board is uh, keenly aware, there was no increase in the foundation level, has not been for multiple years now. Uh, the state is uh, prorating it down to 89 percent. Uh, we added the model. 85%. There was talk at one point of it dropping into the low 80s. Uh, they landed on 89%. Uh, one thing that is beneficial uh, financially to the district is our poverty grant money is going up. It's not obviously beneficial that we're claiming more uh, kids that are in or more children in poverty, but we did see some increase that helped offset some of that proration. 
Um, we also have had to, in the past, move general state aid funds into our transportation fund, as that fund has seen less money in regular ed, uh, state funding, categorical funding. Uh, this year, we were able to reduce the amount that we put into the transportation a little bit as a result of the favorable contract uh, per the bid, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, state categorical, uh, mostly now it's special ed funding and transportation funding. There's some bilingual and some driver's ed. Uh, that's budgeted accordingly. We, we, we're keeping an eye on uh, where that money is going. The uh, tuition reimbursement uh, amount was increased because we are seeing an increase in cost of tuition, which the expenditure side reflects as well. Uh, of note, again, this is uh, looking a little bit back. Uh, when I spoke to the board in June, I mentioned that we had received three of the uh, four payments from the state uh, for, the, for the current fiscal year. Uh, on July 1st, the state of Illinois uh, released or vouchered the fourth payment, and we received it on July 3rd. So, uh, crossed into a different fiscal year. I don't know why they could have, couldn't have done that in June 30, but uh, the audit will pick it up on the accrual side. But uh, we did, we are, the state is for all intents and purposes caught up. Uh, whether that will continue, um, uh, we always uh, budget for four payments, never knowing which, uh, what variation of years it will come in, but uh, the state did get caught up, so hopefully, that, again, that's a good sign. It was, you know, uh, we got payments in, uh, uh, you know, March and then and again in April when the surprise money came into the state, so that's hopefully they're on the road to recovery from that standpoint, although I think they still had a $6 million deficit for their budget. Uh, performance contracting, uh, there's some grant money associated with those uh, projects. We have about $400,000 contract out on this. We have about 100000 in grant money uh, that we're set to receive. It's so, uh, similar to what happened with Wheat North and Franklin and Lowell uh, last year. Uh, that funding came in and it came in rather quickly, so that's uh, uh, in the budget as well. Uh, I mentioned back in June that the district, as part of the safety work, had applied for a state maintenance grant. Mr. Wilkie did a lot of hard work to put together that maintenance grant based on our safety and security work. We found out that that money was not awarded to the school district. There was a very small number of school districts that did receive the funding, and it was uh, not the full amount either. And I think I mentioned in that June meeting that the amount of money that was remaining was far less than the first phase, but uh, unfortunately, we were not awarded that grant. Federal funding, uh, National School Lunch, Title I IDEA. Uh, we've got some carryover in Title I and IDEA that are in the budget that have uh, been working closely with Faith and, uh, and Joanne's department on, on looking at that funding and how that's coming in. And we've got that carryover money budgeted as well. National School Lunch still continues to be uh, a, a, a large number as far as the amount of students. Again, 27% uh, on the free and reduced lunch and the district that uh, uh, take advantage of that program. So uh, that funding is in there as well. On the expenditure side, in total, um, the education fund and o and salaries are based on the recent collective bargaining agreements that the uh, Board of Education has in place with those groups. Uh, we are going to be bargaining uh, this year, again, with the classified staff. Uh, I believe that's in one of the board goals. Uh, so uh, that will be coming out this spring. Uh, on the teacher side, they have step uh, the teacher uh, their step movement in March, so they, they get a mid year around 12 checks. Uh, they get their uh, their step movement, so it's uh, half the million four it costs so about 700 thousand dollar increase. Uh, there's a zero percent on the base again this year. Uh, teachers are eligible for obviously for lane movement uh, that that's uh, in there as well. Uh, there is obviously restrictive language in the contract and we move once a year and, and we've been, done a pretty good job of restricting that but uh, lane movement is included on the CEA they're getting step only this year uh, nothing on the base uh, administrators and non-union are in the two percent range uh, the budget is uh, indicated as indicated in the budget uh, substitute pay one this is something we're looking at we are there is a uh, we are having difficulty filling substitute pay. It was one of the reductions that was uh, done through the uh, budget cuts a few years back where we dropped it pretty significantly. Uh, in order to try and stay somewhat competitive, we are going to be raising it uh, uh, by $5 to see if hopefully that'll assist and look at some other ways to have some uh, 
uh, permanent subs that will uh, hopefully help us in filling uh, those holes in the classroom when teachers are out. Benefits, uh, we are having a, 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 a pretty good year uh, so far with our benefits. We're tracking about 89% of anticipated claims. Uh, we're in the process of negotiating with Blue Cross Blue Shield. We believe our administrative costs that we'll bring to the board next year, or excuse me, next month, uh, will be a reduction in administrative costs. So we're also uh, looking at the specific and, and stop loss coverage, and, and the Blues are anticipating that our, our claims will be relatively flat next year which is, uh, I think, a good thing. Um, we ended up a little bit better uh, at the end of the fiscal year uh, than what was budgeted. So uh, we're working off of that, of those actuals. So we anticipate uh, somewhat flat. We do have some increase built in there uh, into the expenditure, but it's uh, relatively flat. And that's uh, good news as well. Uh, decrease, another good, good news thing, decrease of unemployment benefits. That number uh, went up as we did do some budget cuts we had to uh, move the cost up, and, and that number has come down significantly, and so the budget will reflect that decrease as well. Uh, TRS penalties and ERO, um, uh, ERO at six percent. We have about 170,000, 170,000 dollars in penalties uh, related relative to ERO and the six percent uh, costs, and those are built in as part of the TRS cost in the budget, as well as what we have to pay in uh, uh, to TRS. Uh, uh, as a district as well. Textbooks, we're down a little bit this year and working with faith, or maybe working over faith <laughs> a little bit on the textbook costs, and we're uh, so we're down over the prior year's budget, uh, and it's reflected in there. Uh, tuition, uh, tuition costs have increased dramatically. Uh, the budget so indicates uh, we're still uh, working through that number. I know Dr. Harris just signed uh, a number of outplacement costs uh, or sh sheets for, for the district and we're working with special services uh, to see where we're going to end up. That number may change, but it's a pretty significant cost. Uh, the tuition line item is over $5 million. We're at $5 million right now. Um, a lot of that is outplacement of 77 or so students. Uh, we also have the uh, TCD costs and such in there as well for our uh, vocational. So that's in the budget as well. Technology, we've kept the budget flat uh, from where we were last year as an expenditure. I know Mr. Mack is looking at different ways to uh, reprioritize and spend uh, the funds available under the technology budget. Uh, o and on the utility side, electricity, natural gas, and water. Uh, Colin has again done a fantastic job with our electric and gas costs. Water has gone up, as I mentioned, back in June because of the, of the city taxes that have gone up considerably, as we all know, as homeowners as well. Uh, but uh, the gas uh, utility costs, we're uh, trying to keep a lid on that as well, and Colin's done a fantastic job. Uh, the energy education contract, which was in the budget last year, has since expired, so that line item is no longer in there uh, for uh, for the energy education contract, which was part of that uh, utility um, deferment pr uh, process, so that is no longer in there. Uh, performance contract, I mentioned before, that's in the budget as well for the work that we're doing at Wheat Morville South this year relative to lighting and heating uh, projects uh, there, and those are underway. Uh, transportation, I mentioned the bids came in very favorably, so that budget has been reduced based on the award of those contracts. Um, I mentioned also last time the IMRF pension rate that is, uh, the district has to pay for as uh, non certified staff was reduced. Uh, preliminary, we get preliminary numbers, and it's been reduced uh, slightly over the prior uh, fiscal or calendar year, excuse me. I uh, just want to talk a few budget impacts. Uh, the transportation contract I mentioned a couple times, it's down significantly. The uh, waste removal contract, we saw reductions there. Custodial services staying somewhat flat. And then um, the legal services with Robin Schwartz, we believe will also uh, garner uh, less costs here, hopefully, uh, as we move forward with our legal bills. These are four major contracts that were uh, bid out this past year. Uh, other budget impacts, uh, the board uh, awarded the transfer uh, to the capital projects going to pay for the fields. Uh, we uh, benefited by the, um, the weather somewhat, uh, getting those fields done in an in, in expeditious fashion. If you recall back when we did it the first go around, it was, uh, uh, we had some delayed 
uh, action that was partly contractor, partly weather, but uh, a lot of projects are, are being done around the state right now, and because of the weather, those work, uh, that work was delayed somewhat because of the weather and ours, because we were just doing a quick replacement, uh, happened uh, in good order. Uh, one budget impact that's a non-impact is the pension obligation. Um, you know, as we talked about in January, uh, the Board of Education, uh, we illustrated the Board of Education, it was important to, to have the impact of the pension, potential pension obligation, even though we were uh, somewhat looking at what uh, the, you know, the talk of the town was as far as how much it was going to be and how, when it, how it was going to be instituted. And obviously, nothing ever came to fruition in this regard, but I think as I mentioned in the June meeting, as we could uh, start building the, the financial uh, profile model again, uh, FPP model, I think it's prudent to keep something in the budget looking forward, in the forecast moving forward in this regard. Um, I, I, I can't prognosticate what's going to happen down in Springfield, but I think at some point uh, that's going to come our way. I know that the universities were looking at something to. Uh, be a model uh, which had a pension shift, and I think that's the basis for the or the springboard for getting it uh, uh, moved on to this at the local level for schools as well. So, uh, just a recommendation. While it's not impacting the budget this year, uh, I think as we look forward in our forecasting, we probably need to be uh, mindful of that. I'm going to go through the funds uh, real quickly. Just get some uh, financial information. Uh, relative to each fund, the education fund, the largest fund in the district. Uh, we're at revenues of 109 million, which is about 84% from local sources, 13.3 uh, million from state sources, or 10%, and then 6% uh, of federal sources, which is about $73.3 million. Uh, total revenues are about 130 million in the Ed Fund, and this represents about a 2.96% increase over the prior year budget. On the expenditure side, we have 100, a little over 113 and a half million in salaries and benefits. It's about 2.65 percent increase over the prior year budget. Uh, and then, like most districts, uh, salaries and benefits makes up uh, about 87 percent of the education fund budget. About um, almost 7.5 million in purchase services. It's a slight decrease over the prior year. It makes up about six percent of the Ed Fund budget. Uh, 3.2 million uh, in supplies. It's about a 6% increase over the prior year budget. Uh, a little over 500,000 uh, capital outlay. Uh, that's about four and a half per, or 4.8% increase. It makes up less than 1% of the Ed Fund budget. And then dues and fees, as I mentioned, uh, tuition and other. This uh, is a large increase for, specifically to the tuition costs uh, that we're seeing as far as uh, outplacement and, and other. That's total expenditure of 130 million. It's about 2.9 percent increase over the uh, prior year budget. On the O&M side, this is our operations and maintenance fund. Uh, we have 11.2 uh, million, or almost 99 percent, all coming from local sources. I previously mentioned that we we have budgeted 100,000 in revenues from the state sources. That's the uh, grant money from the uh, performance contracting. Uh, total revenue is about 11.3 million. It's a slight decrease over less than one percent over the previous year. Uh, this budget. On the expenditure side, 3.1 million in salaries. It's about a two percent increase over the prior year budget. Makes up 28 percent of the O&M budget. Uh, almost 3.8 million in purchase services. It's a six percent decrease, and some of that is associated with the reduction of the, uh, the contract for energy education that was in the budget last year. Uh, 3.6 million uh, supplies utilities. It's less than one percent decrease. So it makes up 32 percent of the budget. And then 750,000 capital A outlay is a uh, almost doubles. A lot of that is tied into the safety and security uh, project that was put into place, as well as some, uh, other expenditures under this line item for equipment. And total expenditures of 11.3 million. That's about a 1.59 percent increase over the prior year budget. Bond and interest, uh, 16.8 million, that's all local revenue, uh, local taxes. Uh, 6.9 million in expenditures. This is a payment on principal and interest in the capital lease for the performance contracting phase one work. We are paying for that out of uh, the bond and interest fund. We have about 1.1 million in interest earnings sitting in there. 
uh, that we're using to pay down uh, this, this capital lease. Transportation side, uh, 4.1 million or 53% coming from local sources, and then 3.6 million or 47% coming from the state sources. And again, this is a categorical funding for special ed, regular ed, and then a, a bit of general state aid funds that we put into the transportation fund. Total revenues of 7.7 .7 million. That's about a 2% decrease over the prior year, again, associated with the contract that was favorable. On the expenditure side, we have 125,000 for salary and benefits. That makes up 2% of the budget. Uh, 7.2 million purchase services. This is the largest uh, item, obviously. It's 93% of the budget. It's paying the contracts for uh, the transportation services to, to the vendors who are subtran and Illinois Central. And 428,000 for supplies, the gas escalator, and capital outlay. It's about a 7% increase uh, in the budget. Total expenditures of seven point nine million dollars. It's about a two percent decrease as well over the prior year budget. I am Russell Security, three point eight million all in local revenues. That's a ten point ten and a half percent increase. Again, this is where we've infused more uh, tax levy money into the prop up uh, to balance out this fund, and as well as the corporate personal property tax money that we moved in additionally as well. And we have expenditures of three point eight million. That's about a five point percent increase over the prior year budget. Capital projects fund, I mentioned the transfer from O&M of $860,000. Uh, includes the field turf projects at Wheat North and Wheat Warren uh, Bill South High School uh, that uh, approved, was approved in the spring. Working cash, uh, this is the, uh, we don't levy into this fund, but we do have cash balances and earn interest on those cash balances. So we have 60,000 budgeted and revenue associated with interest that's earned on the fund balance. So looking at all the revenues by all funds, uh, you can see that uh, uh, this is every every fund in the, uh, for the district. 86% uh, of it's done lo is local money, 10% is state, and then 4% is federal for a total of 169 million, almost 170 million. Um, on the operating side, which is just the operational funds of the district, which is the education, the O&M, uh, transportation and um, IMRF Social Security Fund, as well as uh, working cash. You can see uh, we have 153 million uh, percentages drop a little bit as far as uh, uh, what makeup of is local, state, and federal. Really change a bit. On the expenditure side for all funds, uh, you can see salary and benefits is 120 million or 71 percent, um, and then. Uh, purchase services 11 percent supplies makes up four percent capital outlays one and tuition and dues and fees another is 13 or for 170 million um, operating funds uh, again this is just the yeah, everything but bond and interest and capital projects fund you can see almost 80 percent of what we do is salary and benefits which is pretty typical for school districts 12 percent purchase services four percent of supplies utilities capital outlays one percent and dues and fees and tuition about four percent 153 million. So if you look at the all fund summary that's in the, at the end of the uh, end of the budget book, you'll see that uh, it shows an operating balance deficit of about 850,000. That's specifically related to the again, this is all funds is related to the movement of the uh, fund balance into the capital uh, renewal fund, uh, or excuse me, into the capital projects fund of the school district to cover the costs associated with the uh, work with the fields. But if you look at the operating fund, which is the budget, what we submit to the budget, again, uh, when you when the state form for the budget, it takes a look at the education, O&M, transportation, and working cash fund. They technically don't look at the IMRF fund uh, for the purpose of declaring whether the budget is balanced or not, unless it has a deficit budget or deficit fund balance, then it comes into play. Uh, but currently, on our operating fund summary, uh, for our operating fund summary, we're showing 135 thousand dollar operating balance uh, current. Obviously we're going to be continuing to evaluate uh, what's going on uh, budget wise. We have some staffing uh, at the elementary level that we're keeping an eye on where we may see some changes so we may have to adjust accordingly but currently uh, the budget is showing a positive operating balance. In comparison over the prior year operating budget you can see that uh, revenues are up about 2.7% and operating expenditures are up again uh, about 2.6. Uh, again, this excludes bond and interest of capital. This is the operating fund of the district. 
At this time, I will take questions. I know I went through that somewhat quick, but I uh, take questions on the budget. I know the board has asked some questions already. I need to expand on any responses. I sure will. Uh, I think it's important uh, as a board of education to recognize that two thirds of uh, your peer group are out there uh, adopting budgets that are not in balance. I think the uh, the uh, reductions that were made a few years ago uh, obviously have played a big factor in that, as well as the collectively bargained agreements with our teachers and our custodial uh, clerical uh, staff have come into play as well to help uh, as we move forward here with our budget. Um, uh, again, I think it's uh, a testament that we, uh, we again have a balanced budget and, um, <laughs> and uh, we'll continue to monitor it until the time of adoption. Uh, but I'm, I'm ready to take questions. I have a few. Uh, number one, the, the uh, earlier tonight we had a presentation by uh, our janitorial staff and uh, they made reference to the GCA services contract. And I believe right. <clears throat> the comment I heard in that presentation was that uh, our, our RFP indicated that we somehow restricted them from having uh, uh, health uh, components to their in their bid. Is that a correct statement? We did a base bid uh, for the uh, for the custodial services that did not include insurance. We did an alternate uh, that did include insurance, and we saw a range of anywhere from a hundred thousand to over five hundred thousand to include insurance. Uh, Given that ACA was on the horizon, the, uh, the uh, exchanges are going to open up October 1st, and I think three states have already uh, put their exchanges out and seen uh, some decreases. Uh, we went with the base bid, uh, given the uh, onset of ACA, uh, without uh, insurance. Okay. Uh, I don't know if we want to do anything about that, and we can discuss that at some future point. But uh, whatever. Um, Technology you indicated was flat from the prior year. Correct. And Mr. Mack is working on reprioritizing some of the expenditures within that within those parameters. How do we enhance that in future budgets? How do we how do we get to where I think we need to be, or I would hope that our board and our goals think we need to be? Uh, how do we get there? You know, with keeping uh, budgets flat. I think Dr. Harris mentioned the reprioritization of uh, or looking at different ways to fund, whether it be fees or looking at way, different ways of doing business within the expenditures that we have. Uh, obviously, staffing makes up almost 80% of our costs. Uh, the, the other 20% obviously is, is pretty thin, so we're going to have to look at maybe different ways of doing business, different ways of uh, you know, trying to find uh, you know, available revenues or offsetting revenues to, to, to make it work. I noticed one of the comments in here talked about the uh, cost of textbooks. I think it was in the comparative from prior year to this year, and it was about a seven or eight hundred thousand dollar cost, as I recall. Correct. Uh, if we were doing that electronically, would there be a savings? If we were getting textbooks uh, electronically versus. Well, textbook companies still want to make money. Um, I know a lot of, uh, while I don't delve into the, the textbook world, I know from past conversations that, you know, there's still, there are, you know, and, and as being a parent in the district, there are a lot of online resources of textbooks that, where you can go in as a school district, however, you have to buy the books. If you were to, you know, I, in my perfect world, every student would have, have an iPad or something and, and won't get specific, that's what I care about, but I won't get specific to the brand, but and where they would walk in and they would, you know, the student would have that and all their textbooks would be on there and, um, you know, that, I think that's the world I think we hopefully we'll get to at some point, but I, I would much rather spend 700000 on equipment that, you know, comes with that, all of that downloaded, but I don't know where we're at in that reality. Well, let me comment briefly on that. I do think some of those print sources, it depends on the grade level. It depends on the age of the kids. It also depends on the curriculum content. I think there's a lot of factors there, a lot of variables uh, where that plays in. Um, some online resources are uh, better than others. There's no doubt about it. I think that would be a strategic approach that if, you know, as we plan into the future, whether it's textbooks, there's also uh, one of the targets that we talked about this evening, or it's part of the um, superintendent is the virtual learning. That's another you know situation where we may or may not have print resources that we could you know reduce in the future. Uh, we also have staffing 
could uh, issues with that. If we have less kids, you know, you can, in a virtual environment, as we heard from our charter school friends that came a few months ago, you know, they were doing a 50 to 1 ratio. Well, we're not there. You know, in our classroom 612, we're in a 25 to 30 range, you know, in our staffing ratio. So as you get more and more digitally, but that would take time. I mean, we would have to prioritize staffing. We'd have to prioritize resources, whether it's the print materials, whatever they are. Um, and so I think it's a combination of things, but we need to plan accordingly and obviously then provide the professional development along the way for staff and for the classroom implementation. Faith, anything am I missing in the digital textbook arena? Um, just the initial cost of the device uh, is very costly to get that first in the hands. And then there is the additional licensing that would come along with just like the purchase of textbook, the license per device. But the really the big it is so anyway, you can hear me. Um, the the initial setup cost of getting the device into everyone's hands is the cost uh, factor right now. Uh, as we're getting ready and looking at a lot of our high school textbook adoptions, because we have not been doing your textbook adoptions for quite some time for budget reasons at the high school, um, that is one of the things that we will be looking at as possible. A couple other ones, so real quick. The, uh, the, if I understood you correctly, the CPI increase in the teacher's contract is zero, but overall there is an increase of approximately 3% in total compensation? Yes, we have uh, about 500000 budgeted for lane movement. Um, the half step cost about 700000 uh, so that's about $1.2 um, There's zero percent on the base. Uh, nothing is tied to the CPI in the second year of the contract. The third year step would be contingent on the CPI, which we know now. Um, so there may not be a step in the third year of the contract. There's one percent on the base. And, but I mean, in this year, we're projecting in the budget about two, to th uh, two and a half, three percent is it? Correct. Okay. Uh, just so I understand, on, on, you, you talked about health insurance. We, we as a uh, district offer really nice plans. Uh, is that is that part of the union contract? Is that uh, is that anything uh, that you know? Uh, is is that a negotiated item? The benefits out of that? Yes, we have a plan document that's a negotiated item. Okay. Uh, one other item, uh, or two other items, really. Uh, tr transportation fund deficit. Uh, we have about a four million dollar deficit, and it looks like there's a break even. Uh, budget in the transportation fund, and, but coming in, our fund balance is about four million negative. Uh, I would think that you know we should give consideration to the transferring money from work to cash and cleaning that up if we're not doing it by operations. Uh, and then I noticed a couple, one other item on the actuals compared to this year and last year. Even though we had more revenue, we did overexpend the budget in a couple of funds. Yes. Uh, it, is it? One day I'd like to hear whether that's uh, whether we have to do budget modifications. I think we need to address that. I think that's because in theory the budget is giving us the authority to spend dollars to a certain amount. And if we overexpend those, even though we may have revenues that offset it, I believe that might be the requirement that we need to uh, amend the budget or do another budget or whatever. But it's something to look, that we need to look at. So sure. That's it. Yeah, Bill, if you bear with me here. Um, in going through the budget, I noticed uh, that in the supplies, you, um, it's on page one of the actual budget document. You, I'm sorry. On, uh, yeah, supplies. As you pointed out, I think we had a 6.46% increase. I rounded it up to 7%. What's the basis for that? Uh, jump of, of almost 7% in supply purchases? Uh, some of it's related to how grant funding is being used, um, if, if there's additional grant money in there. Um, some of it is how schools may have budgeted uh, their, their, and they're within their own allocations that we give to them. Uh, it's, uh, I think that's probably the main reasons. Yeah, could you explain it to me a little bit? Uh, the 10% increase in tuition uh, outplacement, is that where we need to place some of our students in other districts or in other schools? Yes. What is, is that because of disciplinary issues or because of special ed issues? I, mean, I will comment on that and I may defer to uh, Ms. Monopolis here uh, for clarification. 
you know, we through the IEP process, when we go through special education students, we have a wide range of programming in our from a least restrictive environment. Uh, if we do not have the particular resources and programs to meet the needs of the students, then we have to seek an outside placement for that. What we have seen recently, and I went through every one of those, uh, I just signed all those last week, um, pretty significant needs of, of kids, a lot of hospitalizations, um, a lot of it social emotionally related, um, a lot of autistic um, cases and scenarios. Um, those are the couple that come to my uh, you know head right away. Anything I'm missing there, Joanne? No, you summarized it pretty well. No, you actually summarized it very well because we do, in-house we have phenomenal programs. However, we are starting to see the increase of student needs changing, um, specific to the emotional needs and then um, more so students who need um, programming beyond what we can offer, which again um, falls in line with students with autism and some of those other low incidence needs that we just don't have the programming. We do our best to keep our uh, uh, stuff in house, you know, our, our students in house in our in our buildings and in our programs. Uh, I would. They also in the private placements, they're raising their fees. So you know, in the private school scenarios, you know, if we find the placements that appropriately believe can meet the needs of students, you know, they have a lot of latitude there um, to to meet them or to raise fees. And you know, we, we do look at that. We do generally have options. So we're not just stuck to one particular um, private placement. So we do look at those, but I know that's the case. We've seen an increase in those pieces as well. It's a combination thing. And I think it's important, again, to note uh, that that number used to be over 100, and I think we're down to 77. But as Dr. Harris mentioned, the uh, uh, sorry, the uh, the cost associated with the programs is just, just skyrocketing. Sky maybe a, a little much, but it's, it is going up quite a bit. I think you anticipated one question I had it's with respect to budget item for substitute teachers. Uh, I take it we're having difficulty attracting substitute teachers at the, at the current pay that we're offering. Yes, we did a market study and looked at other districts and you know for us to stay competitive we do need to raise that rate a little bit. We bumped it way back three years ago and we do need to increase it to, uh, you know, $5 this year. We'll take a look at it, see if that makes a difference for us. We, we even thought about bumping it a little bit more, but we're going to try this and see how, if it makes a difference, we may have to increase it even later on, you know, into the future if, if we need to. But we have had some trouble uh, keeping subs. If they, they can go someplace else, make 100 bucks a day, you know, I mean, this is where this comes in. Create some problems for us sometimes at 6.30 in the morning. Um, and on page six of the uh, post budget, on equipment, I noticed that we had for equipment uh, budgeted in 2012-13 year 500,000, and then for the 2013-14 year 540,000. Is that the computer equipment and tablets that uh, we targeted for the high school? Is that, uh, that that was done through a lease. Uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, this is a, a good portion of it. It's rods right here, but. I think it is some equipment purchases that he's got in his budget. It's sir, it's uh, servers, it's hardware, it's network, it's server updates. So I believe, I'm not sure where went, but uh, you can comment on that. I think it's back in the, but that's what it is. Well, then I'll save my questions about technology until okay. right. it comes. Right. Well, actually, next question. Um, on well, let me go to the next question. Maybe it's, it's for Rod too. On page seven, I noticed a nine percent increase in telephone costs. I thought we were supposed to experience some savings when we upgraded our telephone technologies. What's the basis for that? I'll, de I'll defer to Rod. I know he's been working closely with Ameritech and or AT and T, and I know that there's uh, some credits due as well. But I, uh, I would defer to Rod. And then I'll take a stand at the question is. Uh, our phone costs. Uh, I, we have increased our bandwidth, and we, you know, the board, we talked about that uh, a few months ago. Uh, AT and T there that includes that that payment to increase our network bandwidth for all of our buildings for the internet. So that's where some of that uh, increase is. But I'll certainly defer here. Uh, we'll have that question. Rod, I noticed our our budget uh, for telephone expenditures for. 
uh, the upcoming school year increased by 9%. I was under the impression that with uh, technology upgrade, we experienced some savings in California. We would, but there's more than just a one telephone. If mine didn't work, sir. The, the uh, also cell phones, all of those other pieces are into that also. Um, the uh, PRIs that came in um, are being evaluated right now too to try to see some savings. These budgeted amounts we put in are more for the flat to cover us so that we don't get these little, you know, spikes of crossover. This year during the time we will be running two networks until we're all on that new one that was approved last year they're still in the process of moving that so we wanted to make sure that there's enough in there to cover that we'll have half schools on the old one which is the more expensive one some schools on the other one which is you know kind of that break it's more of a break even for more service if you remember how it was presented there's a you know a small percentage of change both the amount of cell phone use and things like that that we're increasing it kind of eats all of that up if that makes sense it does yeah this kind of leads to my overall question about our technology plan upgrade plan that we adopted almost three years ago now. Are the, the budgeted items in this year's budget for technology upgrades, improvements on software and everything else consistent with that plan that we reviewed or have there been some adjustments made over time? Where do we stand in essence with respect to the technology upgrade plan? It, yeah, there have been adjustments. I mean, I think this year without, you know, the, the increase that we were looking for, the one thing we did focus in, in reallocating some of the current funds with that flat balance budget was uh, more to the equipment piece and it, it kind of does work to that stability and reliability to make sure that we did get those devices for students. I mean, I think that's the, the big priority. We have the network in place to be able to handle that. So we'll have a little bit more, you know, we're still going to deal with when the wind blows in Wheaton, there's going to be some issues. We, you know, that a lot of that money was allocated for that reliability, that stability, uh, keeping the phone system up when power's out. Um, we have backup plan for that with emergency lines. It's just a little more cumbersome to use those. So, we've we've done the right allocations to make it. You know, so it's very student focused in these changes until you know until the money is there, we'll we'll be able to work through. The other thing, too, I want to comment on, you know, we, we have to prioritize the things, you know, if somebody, if, if, if whatever department is, in this case technology, you know, we, he, you know, we requested an additional $800,000. We don't have it. We don't have it to have a balanced budget, so we can't expend it. So therefore, we had to reprioritize some of the needs. Now, a lot of it's tied up in the capital uh, lease that we are refreshing all the machines, but both mm -hmm. high schools, the summer process is in place right now. Um, that's a significant part of that. What we aren't be able to do is some of the, um, to hit some of those reliability and stability targets for instance, critical air. You know, for battery backup and, and some type of generator backup for this building. When power goes off, we don't have that. We don't have critical failure responses there for that. And it, you know, the power goes off in this building quite a bit you know, because of the local situation. Um, you know, I've talked with Bill about this. If we get toward the end of the year and we have some, uh, uh, balance in our own end budget, we might be able to do some of those things that we, you know, that we had uh, projected for uh, in the technology, but we might be able to do it out of one end. Don't want to promise that. It is a critical need, though. If we can't, you know, give ourselves, you know, an opportunity there for this critical resource to be on 100% uh, of the time, it, it does create problems for us. So that's one example of something that's not going to be addressed. That's a decision point. We're going to buy student laptops instead of. Um, you know that critical failure piece um, so we might have some um, downtime situations based on power um, so that's an example of where a decision point is but we're going to go to integrating into the classroom and, and getting devices in the hands of kids and staff instead of trying to build some of these uh, backup scenarios if we are able to do it as the year goes along we might come back with you know those solutions out of our own budget and I, I take it that the uh, budget didn't allow for the hiring of additional technical staff uh, for the department, is that correct? That is correct. That is not included. And last question. I'm sorry. Last question. I apologize for the one of these questions. Um, on page 10, uh, Bill, uh, um, operations and maintenance, capital renewal, uh, the revenue 
projections there for 2013-14. Is that performance contracting services there? Is that who that preference is? Yeah. yeah, that's the uh, that's the performance contracting. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. A couple follow-up questions. I just, uh, overall, uh, I read the paper today. I think uh, there's a certain kind of retirement in the area, and there was a discussion about a financial achievement. That financial achievement was that the district had a policy of uh, having a certain percentage of fund balance uh, you know, as compared to its revenues in the operating funds. I made a quick calculation on that shortly after reading that. And it appears to me that based on where we are at uh, currently, uh, as compared to the current year's uh, revenues and so on in the operating funds, that we have about a 29.6% uh, fund balance as compared to revenues in those operating funds which is a little higher, I believe, than the numbers of districts. Now, of course, part of that was de was developed because of the 15, 13, whatever number grant we got last year that came in right at the end of the last, last fiscal year. But I, I think it would be important that we establish a, a fund balance policy that, that says we're going to do that. Now, the reason I say that, one other step that I'm saying is that this year, we have a budget here that's going to roll roughly $900,000 of fund balance. Okay, we have break even on everything except we are using about 900,000 to pay for the two football fields. So everything, if it, we achieve budget equally, we would be a million dollars less in fund balance. Is that a correct statement? 860,000. Okay, exactly. All right. And then the other thing too, you know, again, I, I think we were comparing budget to budget a couple of times. And, and I think that, you know, I, I kind of inferred it on one of my uh, emails in between. It would be really nice to have like preliminary uh, actuals compared to budget because you can see the volatility on some of these numbers from one year to the next and then you know the budget has been modified to reflect that you know i don't know if telephone cost is an example for instance sure. but, you know that that's a big uh, and then just to clarify in the technology uh, jim's question was whether or not we have attained the same level of expenditure as our original plan that was developed a number of years ago and I don't know that I heard the answer to that, but I think the answer is no. Is that correct? So we've, we've reduced the amount that we originally planned going for the past. Year. We had projected that we could increase that each year. This year was to be 2.8 million. We're staying flat at 2 million. So the answer is correct. We're not doing everything that we uh, would have hoped to be able to do based on you know, our revenues. However, you know, it's all about making sure we live within our means as well. Um, just, I, I want to start with a little anecdote. Actually, um, Mr. Matheson gives me a good segue into my questions, which had to do with fund balances. But an anecdote from my first year on the board, we were talking about something uh, that had to do with education, and and I made the statement, "Well, it's only money, isn't it? We're just talking about money here." And I remember Bob Davis looked at me and said, "I I don't think I've ever heard that said on this board before. It's, it's, you know, it's just money." And I was thinking the same with you when you were talking about um, that we should have uh, be dipping into our fund balances. We've got a little high fund balance. I, it's, a, it's a marvelous thing to hear that somebody thinks our fund balances are a little high because I don't think I would have ever thought in all my years on the board that that statement would have been made at the board tables. I and mean, I'm not saying it's a bad one, but I'm saying it's a, we're in a good position if somebody can say that. So. So um, my, first of all, I wanted to congratulate you on the operating uh, fund balance, which or the operating balance, which is about 135,000, and I think that's the, about the highest I've seen in terms of that presented to us since I've been on the board. So that's a that's a great thing. I think I remember one year it was like $33 or something that you were hoping that we would be to the good. So my question does have to do with how we're doing with our, our fund balances. And as I was looking at our year-end report, uh, the treasurer's report for June 30th, and I know that this is preliminary, but it looks to me like our grand total of revenues is about 175.4 million. And then our grand total of expenditures is 174.2 million, which would mean we're about 1.2 million to the good. 
that's not the case, is it? Well, you have to be careful because yeah. you really, I think, on the operating side, as you look at our fund balance policy, you know, our policy speaks specifically to certain funds within the district. It doesn't yeah. include the bonded interest, it doesn't include the capital projects, yeah. and it doesn't include IMRF unless it's a negative fund balance. IMRF has a positive fund balance. I think at the end of last year, if you look at the audit, those funds had about $40 million in fund balance. Uh, you know, they're all things staying equal, and, and the fact that we're, you know, if everything stays, I, I we think we're coming to the good for for, uh, for last year. Uh, uh, so that'll increase our fund balance, and I think that's where Mr. Matheson was going right. somewhere. Um, so yeah, I think the, those numbers that you did are in, in total, I think it's more, you gotta look at the operating that maybe a little bit different, actually maybe a little bit more because of uh, the impact of the capital projects uh, fund, and you know, the 800, how much was spent in there. Uh, capital projects fund. So I think we'll be we'll we'll come into the good, and I think that'll increase our uh, overall fund balance. So, so um, the the one point two million to the good. You're saying there's going to be less to the good, or more probably more to the good. More to the good that we're starting out with. So that's a very good, good yeah, thing. Yeah. Good thing. We'll go conservatively with your number. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. And then. Um, the uh, 440,000 or so that we were thinking that we have put into the projections for the pension shift. Mm -hmm. So clearly, we were thinking we could make an operating budget this year that included 440,000. This year, we don't have that 440,000 allocated to pension shifts, but we've apparently made a budget that uses that 440,000, or is the budget this year lower by 440 than what we thought it was? We're using some of that. We are. So I guess opposite point of view, my thought would be if, if we were planning for a budget where we thought we had to use that for something other than what we're doing in the district, why now are we using it this year instead of putting it away or at least a good chunk of it away for the future when it's likely we may have to use it? Okay. Again, our delta is up between 440, 400. It was around 400,000, and we have a $135,000 operating balance. So our delta is 270,000 on a $150 million budget. So $153 million budget. So it's it's pretty narrow in the grand scheme of things. I mean, again, the impact of losing tax money is is you know uh, you know that has an impact. Uh, again, the the levy for 2011 that we received, um, uh, you know in. in the money we received in that in that levy was down eight hundred thousand dollars. So that you know that's that's pretty significant. So you know when we go to let pass the board to levy for the CPI, we're now seeing while we always budget for ninety nine point eight percent of that, we saw that drop to ninety nine point three. That was eight hundred thousand dollars that you know impacts the budget. And so we reduced how much we believe we're going to get this year to ninety nine point six for this current levy. Uh, so the budget, the money that, we, and we remember the levy always covers two fiscal years. We get it in June, we get it in September. So September's number is less because we reduced it by uh, even two tenths of a percent. It's you know, going to be a couple hundred thousand dollars. So it's that all that comes into play as you look at the budget forecast uh, and, and the impact of that. The two biggest things we increased on the expenditure side too is, and a decision we made recently was the sub pay. We spent one point three million dollars, I believe, on subs this past year. You know, five dollar increase on that is uh, around a hundred thousand dollars, correct? Seventy, eighty, something like that. Yeah, right. it's a, you know, five dollars on an eighty dollar expenditure is yeah. you know, five or six percent, whatever. And so there's one out. item that we decided to do. You know, that we had not you know, prepared for accordingly. Also, this tuition increase was pretty significant. We did not anticipate that. So therefore, you know, there was a couple items on the expenditure side that ate it up quickly, especially with our less revenue. I mean, it, you know, getting things balanced, we still have a lot of decision points along the way to make sure we got into a balanced situation. That's why it's all tentative initially until we actually get the reality of what's where we're at sitting here on July 17. So, so basically it sounds like we've got about 130 out of that 400,000 that maybe we've preserved somewhere. I'm just anxious to <laughs> Keep point, that money. Let's call it 0.002%. <laughs> right. But you. every every bit helps. And if it, if we were looking at 440,000 a year, 135,000 is next year goes towards that. Every penny is a prisoner. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. 
I just wanted to clarify one point. Um, Mr. Madison, I, I, I wasn't sure if you were alluding to the fact that we do not have a fund balance policy, but we actually do. I don't know that you, that, that, and so I wanted to just clarify that because I don't know if I misunderstood you or if you believe we don't have them. We actually adopted one in 2011, I believe. We adopted a fund balance policy. Uh, and so we've been trying very hard to, and, and it's a range. It's between 25 and 40%, I believe. And so uh, that that is our policy, and we've tried to adhere to that as much as we can. The reason I agree. The reason I bring that up is if we adopt that in 2011 and had not got the 15 million from the gold grant, right. we would have been at 20% uh, or less. So, have, yeah. so that, and, and practically speaking, 40% is not even ever achievable anywhere. So I, I think maybe the board would be better evaluate that uh, to make it more appropriate because 25 to 40 is, you know, those are maybe ones in the past, but uh, you know, it's not going to happen anymore. So. Maybe that's the words I should say. We need to reevaluate our target because, again, we're eroding it a bit, uh, and you know, it, it, but it is critical. So, <clears throat> if, there, if there are no other questions, I'd like to have a motion to uh, post the budget. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, one quick question as really as it relates to the transportation budget. Um, <clears throat> homeless transportation is that number within the pupil transportation. It is. And has that increased substantially the past it has. several years? I'm wondering if that's leading partially within the $4 million deficit. And second question is that, is there is that a service we bid uh, as part of the we use tax, We use taxi services, right. uh, currently local taxi services, and it's a hard, it's a hard item to bid uh, because of the nature of what we're dealing with. We transport children from all over the state. I mean, we have kids coming in from Chicago, Sycamore, um, we do go back, if you notice in, in the budget and the revenue side in transportation, there's payments from other LEAs, which are local education uh, authorities. We, we go back and bill them for half the cost, and that number has increased significantly. But we have homeless transportation that we do in district, as well as homeless transportation uh, that are coming from out of district. The out of district ones are the ones that we're billing. Uh, everybody from the city of Chicago to Proviso to Sycamore to wherever, and, I, and Joanne's office uh, coordinates all of that transportation and sets it up. So it's uh, a difficult task, it's, uh, and we do have cabs running around quite a bit, moving uh, children back and forth. Is it possible to approximate how much that's changed over the past three, five years? Uh, it's pretty. I, I can tell you, it's pretty significant. I don't know if I, I don't have the number right off the top of my head, and I'd have to. Talk to Joanne's department tracks it a little bit. Uh, we track it for the purpose of billing, but uh, I only know districts. for the last two years that I've been here. Um, when, we, when I started tracking it in my department, um, but in essence, you know, it's an average. I mean, the students that are in district, you know, there's a lot of students in district. Um, those that are out of district, um, I, I'd misspeak if I were to tell you right now, but. We, we can get that number for you and right. get it to you. But if you're curious on what that is. 66. Right. Yeah, I don't want to give a wrong number. Yeah. And I, I will you know, I want to preface this by saying that is a soft number uh, because one year it may be very high. Some years it may be very low. The McKinley Act was real clear. Uh, the last home school is where the district's obligated to do it. And so for some years we, you know, uh, that, and it fluctuated, it changes day to day to day to day. We have a kid show up, we were obligated to do it. That's federal law. So it's it's a soft number, if you know what I mean. We it, It's hard to bid, it's hard to budget for. Um, all we can do is watch trends. Uh, it has gone up significantly. The economy is a huge factor in that. And we have, we have had trends where we've had students multiple year where we're, we're transporting them because they remain homeless. So it's, uh, uh, and it, and it, it is a, 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 it's a tough, tough thing with homeless and monitoring that and how what we can do legally to enforce it. Yes. I just uh, one comment, uh, Rosemary. I was thinking the same as you relative to the uh, the pension uh, line item. So make sure I'm correct. If we left that line item in there, our we'd have about a half million dollar deficit. That about right. So I guess the question is, is that wise to not have that line item in there? Well, we would have had a, the difference between 400000 and, and 
this point in the game. So two hundred seventy thousand um, dollars. You know, uh, I, I don't envision the, the legislature enacting anything that would fall in under. You know, I don't want a budget for something that's not going to happen in this fiscal year. I, I think it's prudent to keep it in our model for going forward. But the legislature, even if they enact something in the fall uh, session or the spring session, they're not going to make it effective until July 1 of 14 at the earliest. My, we're talking about Springfield, but I'm guessing that I don't think I can imagine that they they would would do something you know mid mid fiscal year to school districts where they would have to start paying in now. Could they do January 1? Maybe, but I, I'm sure they'd hear a lot of feedback from school districts that it should be on fiscal year. Yeah, I, it's kind of like when we uh, we had discussion a year ago whether we should budget for that revenue source. It's kind of the same type of thing. I would not recommend budgeting for something on the expenditure side that we know right now we know is not going to be there. And the same thing with revenues. Remember, we did not put it in a budget when we anticipated receiving that capital grant money because we did not. We weren't sure. We weren't confident, so we did not put it into the budget. And it's kind of the same thing here. Um, you know, if we were to have that expense right now. We'd be finding two hundred seventy million or two hundred seventy thousand dollars somewhere in the expenditure side to meet that obligation. We have to somewhere somehow. Maybe it's a capital project. I don't know what that would be. Or the sub pay. Yeah, sub pay. I mean, there's a multiple factors here where we might to get a balanced budget. Any other questions for Bill? Um, if if uh, if not. I would like a motion to approve to post the 2013-2014 uh, tentative budget. So moved. Mr. Madison moves. Second. Mr. Brown. Okay. Mrs. Sander, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Matheson? Yes. Mr. Roman? Yes, and kudos to Bill for a good presentation. Mr. Mrs. Cockhill? Yes. Mr. Gambiani? Yes. Mrs. Swanson? Yes. Mr. Paulson? Yes. Mrs. Antahar? Yes. Motion is approved. Uh, then our next item of business is um, approval of resolution to the of the Board of Education directing the school treasurer to transfer funds from the operations and maintenance fund to the capital projects fund. May I have a motion? So moved. Moved by Mr. Broman. Second. Second by Mrs. Cockhill. Is, is there a discussion? Mrs. Senator, will you call for the vote, please? Yes. Mr. Broman. Yes. Mrs. Cockhill. Yes. Mr. Paulson. Yes. Mr. Cambiani. Yes. Mrs. Swanson? Yes. Mr. Matheson? Yes. Mrs. Intahar? Yes. Motion, motion approved. Uh, next item of business is the approval of an intergovernmental inter agreement with the Wheaton Park District for the installation of synthetic fields at Monroe Middle School. Uh, this has been addressed before, but I don't know if Dr. Harris has anything to add. Just want to comment briefly on this. I know board members are familiar with this. Um, a situation. Uh, I've had conversations, Mr. Farrell and I both, with uh, Park District staff, specifically Mr. Bernard, about this intergovernmental agreement. Uh, we did go back and forth on several different items on this particular thing and believe that the uh, item, the, the recommendation we have here this evening, um, you know, is the document that we could move forward with. I do know the Park District is meeting this evening. Um, I'm not sure you know, where they, they also were looking to approve this intergovernmental agreement as well. Um, certainly the the obligation is on their behalf. Uh, if they have the revenue to move forward with this, we will work with them on it. If they don't, you know, it may be a year or two before something happens. So I don't want, uh, you know, there are any uh, misunderstandings if the shovel's in the ground tomorrow. So I think it will be contingent upon their revenue sources and what they would like to do there. But I certainly would recommend this agreement as presented. Okay, so would somebody like to put a motion on the table to approve? Uh, this intergovernmental agreement. I'd make that motion. Moved move by Mr. Matheson. Do we have a second? Second, second by Mrs. Swanson. Seconded by Mrs. Swanson. Is there any other discussion? 
Real quickly, I'd like to say that uh, I, I think intergovernmental agreements are great. Uh, I think the uh, park district is uh, not only uh, you know improving our facilities here, but uh, continues to uh, uh, maintain our properties and so on, which is you know a significant cost savings for the district for the use of our properties. But I think that uh, you know this is a you know fine example of good intergovernmental cooperation. I just had one actually had a request. Um, having been through this before, I think it would behoove us and our maintenance staff to make good records of the condition of our parking lots, surfaces, uh, driveways before construction starts to avoid any potential claims that might come back our way or, or costs that we might incur to correct things so we can have a good record of what it was before and know what happened after construction. I've seen this happen before, so I think a little bit of uh, Photographs and videos would be a uh, uh, good insurance policy. We can absolutely do that. Uh, Mr. Bernard and I have already had discussions about access. Uh, when we got tired of mulling through the agreement, we'd start talking about the, the vision of it and how it would work. And uh, Mr. Matheson, spot on, the Park District is, uh, maintains our fields. They do an excellent job with restoration. And, uh, we've worked with them collectively on a number of agreements, but uh, we definitely will. Uh, uh, when the time comes, uh, make those notations and take pictures to make sure uh, uh, we have it documented. But I have full faith in the park district to restore uh, back to the way uh, you know, any, anything that co is caused by construction, traffic, or anything like that. So uh, we'll definitely do that. I endorse this contract entirely. Uh, I think it's a great agreement. Uh, I do have one problem with it. I know. I just know that there's been a, a typographical error made and uh, a word was left out. And otherwise, uh, paragraph three, Roman numeral uh, 3D uh, makes no sense uh, from the legal point of view without the word uh, unreasonably before the word uh, approval in the last line of uh, Roman numeral 3D. So I'm assuming the part district will recognize that as a typographical error when we agree to it. I'll just comment on that. What I will do is follow up with them as well. We can also initial that as a, uh, you know, for clarity. I don't, do not believe they will have a problem with making an adjustment to the agreement. Is there any value uh, that financial exposure is pretty insignificant, I guess, in the grand scheme of the project, but is there any value in trying to maybe set aside or escrow $10,000 until this time timeline? Time uh, clicks off and the, the cancellation uh, becomes null and void for what it's worth? We could provide for that in the o and budget. That's where it would sit. Um, you know, it's some, you know we, we, uh, we have contingency there and certainly can earmark that for that to make sure that we're there. I think that's probably a remote, and the thing about this is project may not start for a year or two too, so you know, it would be a rolling thing. So um, I don't know, Mr. Farley, what's your thought on that as well? Again, I think that the earliest they're uh, looking at maybe the spring. Uh, I'm not sure of the funding, but uh, I, I, I doubt we'd ever get to the point where, where the, the agreement would go that far south, but I think we can definitely uh, account for that uh, contingency. Yeah. Okay, if there are no further questions, uh, Mr. Senator, would you uh, call the roll? Mr. Matheson? Yes. Mrs. Swanson? Yes. Mrs. Packhill? Yes. Mr. Paulson? Yes. Mr. Gambiani? Yes. Mr. Broman? Yes. Mrs. Intahar? Yes. Motion passes. All right. Now we have an oral report on the elementary standards based report card. I know board members are aware that uh, we are implementing a new report card at the elementary level uh, and I'm going to let Faith go through the details of this. We thought it was very fitting here at this time to update the board where this sits uh, because anytime we have a new reporting instrument for our elementary students and parents, um, you might get questions about it. So I want to make sure all board members are informed and I'll certainly turn over to take and let her talk briefly about the details. Right, as Dr. Harris alluded to, uh, having a new elementary report card sounds simple, um, but it is usually controversial. There's usually lots of questions as we go through this. 
there are indeed among assistant soups for curriculum instruction five tasks that you should never start if you're a little worried about job security. Elementary report card revisions is one of them. But anyway, we felt like we really needed to start on this because our current report card does not indicate and does not look at the new Common Core math standards. As you know, we're getting ready to implement all of the new math standards in the fall and our report card was not aligned to that. So in order to report accurately out to parents and also to pull us together on assessment, we felt that we needed to do this. So we met with the board subcommittee of teaching and learning and started on this adventure. There were several staff members along the way uh, that helped on the report card committee uh, and then also we brought in math members from the subcommittee that were working on all the different standards to uh, have their input as well. What was unique that we also did uh, in this process that I had not done in a similar process before is during the March Institute Day, we had every single staff member spend time looking at the math standards and indicating what their priorities were. That was all done through a digital survey, and we had that feedback within two hours then of the entire elementary staff uh, able to get their input into the process. Also, parent involvement was very critical to this. I did some presentations uh, to all the PTA presidents. We also had parents that served on our committee as well wanted to highlight what the changes are. As we got into this process, we didn't just then look at uh, the new math standards. We took the opportunity to make improvements on the card overall. And one of the things that came up that I was not expecting to make the change on was the trimesters. We sat down with the teachers uh, on the committee and they said, Faith, we gotta do trimesters. And really, we gotta do one more change. Not a good thing. But in listening to them and their rationale and what we needed to do, it really made sense for our learners. There are a lot of districts that had already gone to trimesters. And by doing that at the elementary level, we'll have a longer period of time, especially at the beginning of the year, to allow students to show progress and growth. So next year, we are moving to trimesters, but that's only at the elementary schools. Also, we changed learner characteristics. And prior to this, at each of the uh, grade levels, K through five, they had their own set of learner characteristics and it differed from one year to the next. We took the opportunity now to look at the social emotional learning standards as well as some of the learner characteristics for 21st century learners and created a list that would be the same from kindergarten all the way through fifth grade. Obviously, perseverance on a task is going to be different at kindergarten than at fifth, but we wanted to be very um, cognizant of the skills that we were trying to accomplish and have continuity from all the grade levels on that. Also, the biggie, we went to standard-based grading, and I'll explain a little bit about what that means. Uh, it is only for math for the following school year, and then we are working on all the English language arts standards that will be implement, Im, implemented the following year. So we will have another change in our report card uh, the year after that. I want to talk just a little bit about standard-based grading because you're going to get a lot of questions and maybe some feedback uh, on this. And the difference between standard-based and traditional, there are four uh, really main components to that. And standard-based is it's more recent information only. Uh, and the more traditional is you might take an average of the grades. At kindergarten, it's a really great example that we would never do an average. Faith comes into kindergarten, she only knows four of her letters. By the end of the grading period, if I know all of them, we don't take an average of that. However, as we go up in grades, we tend to do that. We take where they were at the beginning, when we were just beginning to teach them, take down that grade, and then even if they've mastered at the end, we take an average of that. Standard-based grading does not do that. Also, uh, the grade is based on achievement only. It's not on how hard they tried. And we do really, you know, effort and persistence and all those things is important. But on standard, it's whether you can add the fractions. It's whether you can apply those skills. It's not just on how well you, how much you tried. Also, from summative assessment versus formative assessment. Formative assessment are those quizzes and assessments that we go through uh, and we get feedback from our students so we know what to teach and what to reteach. Summative assessments are those tests that we give at the end of our instruction. And we want 
to grade students where they were after we taught them, not while we're in the middle of that process. And then also finally, a standard base is really geared toward that skill, not an assessment. If you were wanting to understand different parts of history, some students may be able to do that in a multiple choice test. Some people may be able to do that in writing. Another student may need to do an oral presentation. But again, what do they understand from history is the important. Uh, this is an example that I use with all the elementary staff, and I think it really drives it home. So what I'm going to ask you to do uh, is you're going to pick a student to pack your own parachute. And if you look at that middle line, that is a successfully packed parachute. And if you go along, we have week one, week two, week three, week four. Student one starts up here, doing really well, then takes a nosedive during six, seven, eight, nine, does not pack a successful parachute the last four weeks. Student two is all over the place, really inconsistent. Student three starts down here at week one, we do some instruction, ends up here for the last few weeks. Which student do you want to pack your parachute? Almost everybody says student three. However, if you do a straight averaging of scores, student three gets the lowest grade. We're moving away from that. We want to see where students are at at the end of instruction and how they are doing and present that information to parents. <coughs> All right, so we've got math section here. We've got it organized by common core domain. We've also come up with different grades. We've used one, two, three, four before which was kind of confusing because we used one, two, three, four for effort as well. So now we're going to I, S, and N, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Uh, but that we'll look at whether students are independent, whether they need support, or whether it's not yet evident. We're still going to be working on fact fluency in math. We're still going to have a traditional letter grade at four and five. And that's controversial. To go really standard base, you usually don't attach a traditional letter grade. But feedback from parents, was that we needed a traditional letter grade over the top of that. So ISNN, what that means is whether a student on the math skill can do it independently or whether they need it with support. An example of support, if the rest of the class is expected to do a mathematical algorithm without manipulatives, they can do that with independent. Another student may still need manipulatives and support to be able to do that same mathematical concept. So they can do it but they need more support than what we would expect for that grade level. And then we also have ends that would be not yet evident. I gave a little bit of example already and we're short of time, I'm gonna keep going. Uh, you have copies of the actual second grade report card and fifth grade report card there so that you can see the types of math standards that we are looking at. The math standards, especially at fourth and fifth grade, are much more rigorous in some areas than what they have been. Uh, fractions, for example, proportions, ratios, uh, and the emphasis on algebra is a lot um, higher and a little bit more difficult skill. And we do anticipate some parents' worries and even teacher worries as we make the jump. As we get into Common Core and we build the scaffolding so that they've had it from second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, it will not be as much of a leap. But these first couple of years when we're switching over to Common Core standards at the upper grades in elementary, it is going to be very challenging for some of our students. Wanted to let you know what some of the support is for the teachers. Uh, all of the almost 400 staff members met with me uh, for a half day training. Don't worry, it wasn't all at once. We don't have subs for that. Um, it was uh, half days at a time uh, where they met with me and we talked about the standard based grading. That was after we'd had quite a bit of training about the math standards themselves. We've also pre prepared an electronic grade book that's standard based uh, off of Synergy, and that is being offered to all of our elementary staff. And we have some training on that coming up in the week of learning. All of the curriculum coordinators have been assigned to schools that they are going to be at during the first two weeks of school to help with the Synergy Gradebook piece. Uh, and then the training on the September 27th Institute for Half Day is already uh, going to be about the new report cards. Parent communication is huge. And yes, we sent out things in newsletters in May. And yes, I put out some more information. But until it's actually here, parents aren't going to really think about that a whole lot. So 
We're going to have all of the principals during the curriculum night. I have prepared a common PowerPoint that they're all going to use and talk about this. And then there will also be an insert in the trimester one report card that explains these changes some more. Is that going to answer everybody's questions? No. We're still going to have to field uh, a lot of that. But we're hoping by being out in front of it and doing a face-to-face -face presentation at curriculum night, um, we'll answer a lot of those questions in advance. Questions that you might have. Faith, um, I'm just noticing on, you mentioned there was a, going to also be an overarching uh, letter grade. Is that true? At fourth and fifth grade. So as I look at that fifth grade, uh, where would the letter grade go versus the... Uh, if you look at, on top of the math part there, uh, let's see, do I have that back in my slide so I can show you. Here's the fifth grade card. At the top here where there is the trimester one, two, and three, those big boxes are where the A, B, C, and D would go. So it's right here. And then the individual boxes below by the standards were where the I, S, and Ns would go. So for example, a student would not get on multiplying fractions an A, B, C, or D. They're going to get an overall math grade that's an A, B, C, or D. On the standard base, all the different standards, you'll still have I's, S's, or Ns. Please, uh, will parents see this card, like give an example of it at the beginning of the year? Yes, um, one of the advantages of having a standard-based report card, um, and they are already on our website that parents can look at already, uh, is that you're very upfront ahead of time of these are the math skills in fifth grade that we've got to get accomplished. And part of having that out is we want parents, students, everybody to know this is the goal, this is what we're working on. So that would be shared ahead of time. Uh, we don't want any of grades to be a guessing game. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Great job. Just want to say thank you to Faith and her staff and, and the elementary principals working through this. Um, she is absolutely correct. Anytime you change the reporting uh, mechanism to parents at the elementary level in particular, uh, it's significant. And uh, um, I believe Mr. Paulson has an elementary student still at home, correct? So I'm sure you will see it firsthand. Uh, and I do know that, um, you know, board members, as board members, you might get questions or comments from parents that you see, so we want to make sure you at least were aware of it. If you do, you certainly can direct them back to Faith or myself, and we will be able to follow up. Thank you, Faith. Thank you. Okay, we have two uh, written reports attached to the uh, agenda, a FOIA report and uh, the monthly financial report. Any questions on the written reports? Okay, are there any reports from board members? I have a list of things, but I'll try to be brief. Um, the parking lot update, I'll, now that we've adopted the goals, I'll, I'll uh, get that updated and all cleaned up. Uh, so that's, expect to see that in the next couple days. Um, in response to Mr. Paulson's concern about cuts that we've made in the past that we may want to restore. You forgot about that? Yeah, you no. said that to me so long ago that I, didn't, that I never responded. I'm thinking uh, what we should do is, is refer those, keep them on our list with the Teaching and Learning Committee, the Learning and Teaching Committee, and then review those uh, periodically to see if, if those should be, uh, or can be, or should be, or if there's a need to reinstate them. At least use that to advise us. Or at least what the, pri what the priority would be for bringing things back up. We could do that, sure. Um, uh, okay, tonight we, we set our goals, and so we need to figure out how we're going to accomplish these goals, and a lot of the goals are accomplished through committee work. So one of the things I will be doing is I'll be sending out to you a list of the standing committees and asking you to let me know your interests. I will try to appoint people according to their interests if I can. Uh, those standing committees are learning and teaching, finance, and facilities. Now, the other goals that we established tonight may require some ad hoc 
committee, or the other goals that we set. Uh, I don't know when you feel comfortable doing that. I could, I could talk to Dr. Harris and see which of those he thinks the committee would be appropriate for. Um, and I'll include that information, send that out to you if you think, if you give that some thought. And, uh, and let, let me know as well if, uh, if you think we need some ad hoc committees, let's say example for technology or, uh, um, and, I, and we need somebody to work on the community engagement. And I'm not sure we're ready to establish that. And also we have some goals on communication, uh, you know, better agendas and stuff like that. And I mean, we could work on that as individuals. Mr. Brown and I could certainly work on on that piece of it, but if, if there are some other interests in working on those things, uh, you know, get get back to me on that as well. So I'll be getting that out. We also need to set our chance to chat dates. So we'll do that. We'll do that at the August meeting. So be thinking about what format you would like those to be, and if we should, for now, just leave them the way they have been, where we have one at each high school during the day, and then one, uh, you know, in an evening. I don't know what you're thinking, but get the, I'll, I'll ask you those questions too and look for your feedback in an email. And also tomorrow morning I'm meeting with the president uh, of the park district and the mayor. It's a monthly meeting we have just to chat. And if there's any, uh, is there any information, any comments, any questions you would like me to address? I can certainly tell them we're very happy about our intergovernmental agreement. That's for the week park district. Wait, I'm sorry, I, yes. The Wheaton Mayor and the Wheaton Park District. <laughs> okay, I'll make sure we, we're not unreasonable. All right. Are there any other reports? Okay. Our next regular meeting will be August 14th here at the SSC at 7.30 p.m. Are there any comments on on agenda items? No. We do have need for closed session uh, for the purposes of student discipline. Um, and so we will be adjourning to closed session and there will be action taken after that session. So um, I need somebody to, um, I need a motion for adjournment to closed session. I move to adjourn to closed session. Mm -hmm. uh, moved by Mr. Roman, second. Second. Second by Mr. Cockhill. Mrs. Cockhill, Mr. Roman. Yes. Mrs. Cockhill. Yes. Mr. Paulson. Yes. Mr. Gambiani? Yes. Mr. Matheson? Yes. Mrs. Swanson? Yes. Mrs. Intihar? Yes. Thank you, everybody. The meeting is adjourned.